take that up because I take them with me. You can arrange to how you're going to pick them up. Okay. Um, first of all, how many of you have actually ever been under a parachute? So okay. So a couple of you done. How many of you have been under a round parachute? As opposed to square. Okay. Good. Um, a lot of days you see nowadays is, is the, the, the rectangular wing-shaped parachutes, which have far different characteristics from the pilot emergency rigs that you use. There are actually a few square pilot emergency rigs, but they're very seldom found. <coughs> uh, most of them are from overseas manufacturers and such. The parachutes nowadays, uh, fortunately, thanks to a lot of lobbying from the uh, skydiving portion of the community, now only have to be packed every 180 days. So you get half a year's service, which is most people's half a season. Uh, prior to that, it was 120 days, 90 days, and then back when they had just all um, organic materials, cotton, silk, and such, it was 60 days. And that had to be because every time, if, if you didn't check it often, the fabric could deteriorate, rot, um, mice get into it, and all that. Um, but now, with the advent of the more nylon materials, they've been able to prove that they are reliable and resistant to a lot of the ravages that time will reap on them, as long as they're kept nice and cleaned up. Uh, so you got a 180 day period to work in. The parachutes, when they come to a rigor, need to be fully inspected. We take them, stretch them all out, examine all the lines, all the seams, Everything else, and then I call it. <laughs> it's always one. It's a five dollar <laughs> <in the> contest. <laughs> it's okay. Um, once we've inspected the parachute, then we have to pack it up. And each parachute has its own particular manufacturer's instruction as to how it's to be folded and into the different containers. So you may have two sets of instructions you're working with: the parachute packing instructions and the container instructions. You have to marry them together. If you happen to have something like a strong uh, emergency rig where the parachute and the container are designed by the same company, great. They usually have one set of instructions and that's, that's good. Um, it takes about 45 minutes just to pack a parachute. About another half hour to give it a good check over. And if you're doing a, a real <coughs> seam inspection, which I do for every time I first see a parachute, if, whether it's brand new, or I just had never packed it before. I go from the end of the container all the way up to the parachute and back inside and out to make sure that every seam, the stitching is correct. I've actually seen uh, something come from the factory where this, the bobbin end of the thread was missing for about a foot. That could have been a bit problematic. Uh, it probably would work, but these parachutes are very much over designed. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the, uh, some of the test drops that they've done for parachutes for certification. Uh, I actually got to help with uh, national parachute uh, supplies, phantom rigs, when they were first coming out and test dropping those. And we dropped them with a rather heavy weight, about 250 pounds, and dropped them at various different air speeds. And you can make up for the, the weight and the speed difference by alternating either you're adding more weight or more airspeed. When using the parachute, everyone wants to know is, how low can I go before I open? Well, <laughs> higher is better, always, unless you're above 12,000 feet. Okay? If you have to open low, it's best to have some airspeed. I've jumped from hot air balloons and when you get out and you leave immediately, if you were to try to deploy, you're going to go several hundred feet before you've got enough airspeed and everything to pull everything off your back. Okay? If you're moving at a higher speed, it's going to come out faster. If you're moving with a lot of forward speed, the parachute tends to open behind you and then you swing underneath it. You've probably seen some of the airdrop pictures of the troops coming out. And you'll see they'll come out the door, the parachute will come out like this, and then they'll swing underneath. It's better to open this way and down if you're going to only got, you know, 200 feet. Yeah. I have seen parachutes on a student who was having problems 
who deployed at approximately 250 feet. It opened, and then her feet hit the ground. She walked away from it. I do not recommend that as a emergency procedure. Okay, get out, get it open as soon as possible. How many of you actually have practiced climbing out of your gliders with the parachute on as if you were doing it in an emergency situation? You all should, especially if you have a passenger that you're trying to deal with too. Now, if you're sitting front and back, you both have about the same opportunity to get out. But if you're sitting tandem and you've got a canopy that opens this way, you're not going that way. <coughs> you gotta go over the passenger or he's gotta go over you, one or the other, so somebody has to move fast. You need to make sure that your passengers are briefed as to what they have to do to get clear of the airplane and use the parachute. I work down at the Flying Circus and I brief all of our passengers who go up in an aerobatic ride. Okay? After I put them in the parachute, I'll give them this very simple line. It says, if you find yourself outside of the airplane for any reason, like you unbuckle the seatbelt while it's upside down, or the pilot has told you to get out of the aircraft, as soon as you are clear of the aircraft, you look at the reserve ripcord handle, grab it with both hands, pull it straight out in front of you, throw the handle away. It's done its job. Parachute will open up above your head. You look up, you'll see two colored toggles. Reach up and grab them. Pull on the right toggle to turn right, left toggle to turn left. Steer for the biggest open field you can find. As you get close to the ground, put your feet and knees together, knees slightly bent so that you can hit and roll when you land. It's a very simple procedure. You memorize it, very easy to repeat back. Gives them the basics of what's going to happen. Even though we're in a steerman, I'm not telling them how to climb out and get around because there's not going to be enough time to give them all those wonderful instructions that they probably will never use and will not remember when the thing happens. Emergencies in an aircraft generally tend to happen very, very quickly if you're going to have to leave. You don't have to worry about engine out emergencies. You don't have one. <clears throat> Generally, what's going to happen with, if anything, that you're going to use a parachute for is going to be something catastrophic. You've had a midair, you've had a, a structural failure, and then what's going to happen? Nothing's going to remain flat and stable. You're going to be spinning, you're going to be turning. Who knows what's going to be happening? So you should have a clear idea in your own mind of how you're going to get out, and if you have a passenger, how you can help them. Okay? Make sure you know what you want to do before you get in the airplane. Now, for wearing the parachute, can I have a volunteer up here? There you go. This is a, a strong back system, which is very common amongst you guys. Okay, let me put this on my backpack. You don't have to deploy it, Danny. Yeah. <laughs> Please do not help. Please do not help. Actually, it's fun. Okay. Please do not help. Please do not help. Please do not help. Please do not help. Okay. Pilots are the worst passengers <laughs> because they already think they know everything about it before they get in. Okay? With these types of snaps, these are called quick ejector snaps. Some of you have another type called a B12. Quick ejector. Is easily identified because it has these two little thumb grips that you can pull and it helps unbuckle the parachute. You see this right here? It's not fully engaged. Fully engaged is snapped back. If it is not fully engaged, this can twist free and come unbuckled. So when you're using these, make sure the last thing you do is to push with your thumb and connect them. Now the chest strap should only hold the parachute, basically so these are pretty much parallel to each other. So 
it doesn't need to be tight either. Does, does there... not need to be tight. Now, a lot of people, they don't like really tight leg checks, so they'll just kind of snap those on and maybe just tighten them down a little bit just so that they're more comfortable. This is great when you're on the ground, when you're sitting down. However, when you're underneath the canopy and you're being suspended from right here, all your weight's going to shift down. If you don't have these leg straps tight around the thigh, if you do have them around the thigh, what's going to happen is you're going to sit like this. It's going to just pull your leg up and you're going to be sitting in the set. The alternative is you have them loose and they come up and now you're hanging from the straps, which is great if you want to try out for the Vienna Boys Choir. <laughs> Not so much fun if you want to have children. <laughs> so you want to make sure your leg straps are snug. They don't have to be squeezing you to death. But they should be enough so that you can just get two fingers underneath and it's pressing you against. Okay? Sit down. Right now, that's what you're going to be looking like underneath. See what happens? Okay. Stand up. So is that correct or not correct? I would take this some more. There's one other thing I haven't shown you here is these back laterals. Not all parachutes have them. If they have them, use them. This will snug everything up against you. This is very, very important in a back parachute. Not so much in the seat pack unless it's a military seat pack. And right here, you see this gap right here? If those leg straps are loose and this back strap is loose, guess what happens? All your weight goes that way and so do you. The idea is to stay with the parachute. Okay? All right. As I said, what we were talking earlier about when you're, if you leave the airplane, look for this handle. People have gone into the ground, pull it on this. Experienced skydivers have gone into the ground, pulling on that. Look, reach, pull. Very simple. If you're high enough, you can remember to arch so that you go belly to earth, because that's the best deployment path for this parachute. Belly to earth comes off your back. Now, let me get you out of this. These. How important is the spring-loaded uh, chute? The, the, pilot. the pilot chute? Yeah. The pilot chute is what takes the parachute off your back and extends it into the air. You can actually. You, not have a parish a pilot chute on there. They do that for the uh, one of the old military rigs with the belly work because you were able to pick it, pull it, and throw it out. You actually shake it open. But that was really more for a low speed malfunction. For a high speed, with the equivalent of having to leave the airplane, it was look, reach, pull, poach. And the idea was to push that parachute out into the air. Once the wind catches that parachute, it's going to drag it on out there and it's going to start opening. The pilot chute helps to stage everything in a nice orderly fashion. Pilot chute, when you pull that ripcord, that compressed spring, jumps that off your back. Depending on the type of pilot chute that's in there, your spring may be this high, and it'll be like this high. The biggest one is the Magnum 44. It's a 44 inch spring. It tends to jump pretty far doesn't have to go that far. It just has to escape the burble caused by the air around your body. It was very common in the early days of skydiving for them to use two pilot chutes inside there. So when they pulled, if one of them got caught in the burble, the other one would be outside it and catch. The only problem is that other one is going upside down and it can snag on something. So you don't see that anymore. Most skydiving rigs do not use the spring-loaded pilot chute except for the reserve. We have one that's on the back of our pouch, uh, on our leg strap, or underneath the container that we actually just pull the pilot chute out into the air and let it go. 
you don't see those unless you watch Top Gun and they had the guy actually eject by using a pitch out. <coughs> Pet peeve. <laughs> so you gotta watch it closer. <laughs> yeah, you have to watch. Um, when you pull that, the record and the spring load pilot chute jumps out, it's gonna extract everything off your back. What it's trying to do is pull everything in a nice straight <coughs> even line. Your body position helps to make sure that everything will open correctly. If you're tumbling and all that, you're gonna pull one down on one side or the other. This helps get everything nice and lined up. Most of the parachutes nowadays use a diaper deployment system on the bottom of the uh, parachute. There's either two types. One where all the lines are stowed on the diaper and the other where it is stowed on the uh, parachute itself. And since I'm gonna take this, who has never pulled one of these before? Monogrammers. If you bring this to my house, I'll have you do this before you leave. Put that on. Just pass in the chest strap, that's all we need. And I want you to stand right about here, face the wall. Face that wall. Face that wall. All right? Look down, reach, and pull. Let's see how far this thing goes. All right. So you see this thing goes from underneath the body. It'd be real embarrassing if you didn't do that. I'd have to get Paul's money back. Oh wait, I don't think I charged that. All right, this is a three stow diaper system. The lines are stowed in rubber bands on the bottom of the container. And what it's designed to do is allow the whole line system to come out Everything nice and stretched out. And the last thing that happens, because part of the lines are stowed, is it pulls the rubber bands out and allows the bottom of the parachute to be exposed to air. Now, parachutes, like almost everything aerodynamic, work on the principles of air pressure. The air pressure outside the parachute actually helps pull it, inflate it, you'll see the parachute will open from the top and then spread down to the bottom. And then it kind of flattens out and then it comes back around again. Okay? Uh, this allows everything to be nice and stretched out. Your shoulders are gonna be more even at that point so that the parachute inflates evenly. If you are one shoulder low, it puts the canopy out of the kilter and as it inflates, you can get canopy flowing under a line <coughs> This is known as a May West malfunction. You look up, and it looks like a brassiere. Usually one side, just a small lobe and a large lobe. You can actually get them split evenly in half, but that's very rare. Very hard to land these, because you're gonna start spinning, and you're gonna be coming down a lot faster. Okay? Even the smallest parachute will lower you a lot better than none. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, say that again. <laughs> I can teach you later. <laughs> okay, uh, but you really want to make sure the parachute is sized for your weight, okay? If you are 200 pounds or better, <clears throat> You want to have a 26 foot diameter parachute. If you're lighter than that, you can go all the way down there to some 22 footers. And they'll work. I have seen a six foot, 240 pound man go out <laughs> under a 24 foot Phantom Reserve and stand it up when he landed. He was an experienced skydiver. There's a difference. Okay? probably watched as skydivers come down, you see they come flying on in, and then they bury the toggles, which basically is just increasing the drag and giving them a little more lift, translating airspeed for lift. If you do that in a round, guess what happens? You come down faster. Original round parachutes had no modifications <coughs> to them. So as they inflated, if this was a nice, perfect world, which only exists in three simulation, the parachute would open and it would just come right on down. 
Well, what happens is all that air being pushed in by your weight dragging that parachute down never comes in an, an even direction. There's also other factors such as whether your shoulder's off to one side, because nobody's ever perfectly aligned, or you get a little wind pushing from one side to the other. And what'll happen is that air pressure builds up and it finds the weak spot where it can come out. And as soon as it comes out, the parachute kind of slides like that. And it scoots over, and that sets up the oscillation, because now your body swings underneath, and it swings over the other way. And this is great if you land on the upswing. <laughs> Landing on the downswing hurts. <clears throat> to help alleviate that problem, they actually cut some holes in the parachute. There's one in the very top to allow the air to kind of more evenly go out. And then they put some holes in the back, which do two things. One, it provides a place for that spill to go in a constant direction. It starts flushing out the back. That gives you thrust. So you're going to actually move forward. They connected steering lines to the sides so that you can close off part of that area so that you actually can turn left or right because you're closing off part of that thrust vent and the other one drives it around. Now, now, unlike wings, which turn like this, parachute kind of turns like this. When you open up under a parachute, a round parachute, you basically got about a five degree cone of the area you're going to land in relative to the wind. You're not going to be able to alter much. As far as going upwind, if it's doing more than five miles an hour breeze, you're not going upwind. You're going to land backwards. <coughs> Okay. That's about all they can do is about five miles an hour. Under my parachute, I can do about 25 to 30 when I land. But you guys know about that. All right. Um, there's various different kinds of modifications. You'll see some parachutes don't have the vent at the top anymore. They just use the vents at the bottom. They're actually more effective. And actually come down slower with the holes in the parachute, the vents there, than if you didn't have them at all. And that's mainly due to the spillage that you get during that oscillation phase. Okay? When you come in to land on or around, it's perfectly all right, so your hands are up there around with those steering toggles, to just go ahead and grab hold of the risers. And as you land, just kind of pull down as your feet are hitting. That'll help lower some of the pressure that your feet feel. And you just want to try and just collapse. Let your body be a spray your knees absorb. If you land flat-footed with your knees locked, your hips are going to end up about here, or at least that's what it's going to feel like. If you want to know what it is, just go step outside on one of those little benches out there, step off and just try and hold your knees locked. Somebody please drive them home afterwards. Okay? I think I've covered that just about all. What questions do you have? Yes. Okay, so um, mo most of our gliders are um, built in Europe, uh, mm -hmm. predominantly Germany, but built in Europe. And one of the standard features on just about all the gliders, even the new ones, the new ones and the older ones, is they've all, uh, just about all of them have a, uh, a hard point anchor for a static line. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, not even the guys that fly in Europe all the time, they, they don't all use them. So some of them use them. Some of them don't. I, I don't know anybody in this country that actually uses them. Do you, do you have an opinion on that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> if you were leaving from a stable platform, static line's great. Yeah. Why are you leaving yeah. if it's a stable platform? Yeah. Okay? I'd rather be able to fall away from the wreckage and open in the clear than potentially deploying my parachute into a spinning mass of aircraft. Okay? Also, all the pilot agencies, <coughs> rigs in the US, as far as I know, and I've packed pretty much all of the different flavors of them, do not support static line deployed. Okay? It is ripcord deployed. If you static line deploy things, how many people do you think might just step out of their aircraft when they land and go walk away? And leave a nice trail, yeah. which is great income for me. <laughs> it's a really bad day for you guys, especially if it's a windy day. You may take a second ride. 
Yes. So I have a strong parachute. I've had mm -hmm. a couple riggers like um, turn me away. Most recently at the SSA convention last year, saying they're not, they don't want to pack a strong chute. Is there? Do you have any experience with that? I would totally disagree with that person. I think strong is one of the best parachute manufacturers out there, especially for pilot emergency rigs. Uh, they've pretty much gotten away from the sport parachute area into pilot emergency rigs, aerial deployment for military and things like that. They make a very good system. It's a pain in the butt to put the pilot chutes in, but that's a rigger's problem, not yours. Okay? Um, all of the manufacturers, if they're going to have a rig, it has to go through the TSO. TSO C23B, everybody you know, has to go through that TSO process and get them rated and be used as, a, as an emergency parachute. Okay? I don't know of any modern and new guns that are made that are bad. There are some old ones that are not so good. If you've got anything that's uh, security, it gets questionable. If you have anything that has a security aeroconical reserve, it's grounded. You know, it's, you know, I cut the lines off. I mean, might as well, because it's not going to be packed by the rigger. Um, there's a common belief that parachutes have an age limit where they must be retired. There are some manufacturer recommendations, but there are no age limits. It's a condition limit. As long as the rigger feels that the parachute can be safely used, they can pack. Now, there are some that they just get too threadbare. I'm like, nope, not going to pack them. There's been a couple of parachutes that I've gotten from people, and at least one person here, that I said, no, this, this one won't work. Send it back. Generally recommend that you stay away from the old military surplus rigs. They're a pain in the butt to pack. They don't give you the same performance and reliability of the new stuff. They're, they're, they're ironclad tough. I mean, they will support you, they will let you down, but they will let you down a lot harder because they're made with a different kind of material. This is a calendar material, which means it has almost zero porosity, <coughs> 1.1 ounce or zero of airflow through them, which means they come down a lot slower. The old military ones are like 2.2 ounce, so they're gonna, air's gonna flow through them instead of into them and stopping, so the parachute will come down faster. You want to get faster, you can make it out of mesh, and really come out of that. So. Yes? We often fly gliders with winds well above five miles an hour, sometimes mm -hmm. 15, 20 mile an hour surface winds. Can you talk about how to land with those high winds and what to do after you land? Okay, first of all, realize if it's more than five miles an hour, you're probably going to be backing up to land. Okay, because you want to be facing in the wind. I don't have to tell you how to t tell which way the wind's going. You all should be experts at that by now. Okay. Understand you're going to be going backwards, so you want to check to make sure what's back there. You, know, you have a great field in front of you, but you're backing up into a housing development. You might want to choose to go off to the side somewhere else. It's the same procedure for landing, just as you're seeing it coming down, as you see it, the ground coming up in your peripheral vision, don't stare at the ground. You'll get ground rushing. You'll be mistake when you're going. Just keep your knees slightly bent. And when you roll, understand it's going to pull you more backwards. Try to go to one side. You don't want to go flat over butt, back in, and head. You want to come down and preferably land and spread the, bot, the force along the side of your body. If you roll as you land, it will take care of you. It's called parachute landing fall. It's what they teach the military how to do a PLF. <coughs> Distributes that force of landing. Especially if you're being dragged in any one direction, understand that that's where you're going to go. Now, after landing on a high wind day, you're going to continue to be dragged until it either stops, the wind stops, an object stops the parachute, or you manage to stop it. What you want to do is, you know, people try and fight the parachute, it's going to win. Grab one line. Preferably one from the bottom of the parachute as it's laying on the ground. But actually only one line is only, and just start reeling that in. Once you start reeling that in, the rest of the parachute's gonna lay out flat. It's no longer gonna come <coughs> in the air. 
and you can reel that thing into you're holding on to the end of the parachute itself, then you'll be able to get up and walk around no problem. If you try and fight it, you're just going to go for a longer ride. Yes? You, the thing you said about um, coming down with a parachute versus without a parachute, one of the things that I like, I like to add, because I had, have been involved in some acts of investigations where people have actually gotten in their airplanes or whatever and forgot to even latch their leg. Um, and what you find, and this will just more for, for the group, is that, you know, as we do, we follow our checklist when we're putting our gliders together, no interruption. I, again, I would encourage that as you put your parachute on, <coughs> once you put it on, if you're going to keep it on, you want to make sure everything's latched to your checklist. Uh, I have seen people actually get into airplanes and gliders with those things dangling, and then I see them latching them like the last minute in, but because it's more comfortable. But sometimes you get taken out of your your checklist, and all of a sudden you're flying along, and of course, most most likely nothing's going to happen because rarely people have to bail out of a glider. But when it comes, and all of a sudden you're bailing out, and you're it's not latched, and you pull that rope, well, guess what? You're departing the fix. The parachute's going to go one way, and your body's going to go another. That's an excellent point. It's, it's easy to get distracted while you're doing things, especially if you're concentrating on the airplane and not worried about your parachute. Uh, there is a case that happened about 15, 20 years ago. Where a, a skydiver, very experienced videographer, was going to shoot video, and he was late getting to the airplane. He runs in the back of the DC-3, just carrying his ring. He managed to leave the airplane without the parachute on. <laughs> How could you possibly do that? But he did, because he was so concentrating on getting that video and getting everything right that he forgot he hadn't put the ring on. I, I can't see how that would happen, but it has. <coughs> People have left the airplane with leg straps loose because they're busy dirt diving, whatever they were going to do. Get in the airplane, or you know, buckle gets kind of cramped, and they loosen it up. You know, I get up in the airplane, and first thing I do is tighten my leg straps up, make sure my chest straps done. Every single time. That's me. Some people don't pay as much attention. Now, remember what I told you about them leg straps hanging loose? Yeah, <laughs> they're really hanging loose. <laughs> they can really ruin your day. Because one, you're going to be further down in the parachute. You're not going to be able to reach up and grab those steering toggles. Or in the case of a square, the brakes to release them. You're going to be hanging down there. And then you've got to play this game of seeing if I can tighten up one and get higher and higher. Yes, sir. I have a question. If, if that seems to be a problem and people forget, then why wouldn't they design the chute so that you step into them and then tighten them up so there's no possibility of your not having your legs in what would be a Swiss seat? They do. In fact, one of my parachute rigs is a step-in. There is no snaps, no V12 right. snaps. It just has the friction adapters. So I have to step in. It's very ungainly to get that thing on. You know, you put it on and you're trying to get your legs first. So when you do this little monkey dance. Uh, like trying to get in. It's like suspenders, though, if you wear suspenders. <clears throat> you know? If you do it all the time, it's not so much emergent. But a lot of people would rather just be able to hook the snaps on there and, and hook on. It's a lot easier to do. But again, you still have to adjust things to make them tight. If they were fully tight, you could never get the thing on. Because it's designed not to come off when it's tightened up. Yes, sir? You use the term riser. Is that the steering line and the toggle to it? The risers are what connect the harness to the parachute, okay? And on my parachute, they're connected to a three-ring release system so that I can jettison the main parachute before I use my reserves. On the pilot emergency rigs, other than the military ones, there is no release mechanism. Because why would you want to release your parachute <laughs> if it's your only one, okay? The only reason they had them on the military parachutes was so that they could release one if they were being dragged. Because if one half of your parachute goes free, everything's going to lay down. Yes, sir? Um, some of us have some of the older chutes and stuff, and mm -hmm. some people don't like to repack when I'm in this area and stuff. Okay. But is there an advantage to uh, sending it back to a factory like mine, the National, and having it uh, overhauled? Yes, especially if it's been a while. Um, there are ADs that come out on parachutes, just as there are on aircraft. Uh, for National, there's several ADs. One is for the Kevlar band. 
uh, around the reinforcing. Uh, they, they changed out the diaper from the original design and then changed it again um, to provide better reliability and such. So if yours doesn't have one of those modifications, they would immediately take care of that. Uh, they may also take a look at it and say, you know, this thing just <coughs> shouldn't be in the air anymore. And then, but if you're talking directly with the factory, they usually can work out a deal to, to get it replaced. Um, generally, you're going to probably find that your harness container system takes more wear, tear, damage than your parachute because your parachute's packed nicely inside it. Unless you get your parachute contaminated with water, not so much fuel for you guys, uh, but people take a soda with them and end up spilling. What's the main ingredient in soda? Sugar, Sugar and acid. And the acid will eat away at material. Uh, I've had a couple parachutes that uh, from your club, and I can't remember who, which one was, but uh, one had all kinds of staining on it, where it had obviously been submerged at some point, and there had been transfer of dirt and such into the webbing and into the parachute material itself. And I was very concerned about it, so I went and I talked to some friends of mine who were master riggers, and we then tested it with a substance called Peromocyte Creole all Green which allows me to check to see if there's any acid damage, things like that, and was able to re, you know, certify that the parachute was okay and I could repack it. Um, but a lot, of a lot of riggers might look at me and go, I, I don't know what that is, I'm not gonna put my name to it. Yeah. Yes, sir? Yeah, I noticed that Strong is now putting a card in the parachute with the latest copy of the manual. It's a USB kind of plug-in thing. Mm -hmm. what, you know, what should we bring to you when we bring our shoe? Is there a paper trail? Is there anything in the document um, that you need to maintain? As, as a rigger, I, I maintain a library of packing instructions. If it's something new and shiny, I may not have it, so it's always best to bring the packing manual. Uh, a lot of times people bring me the packing manual, and it's three issues out of date from the new one because they do update them from time to time. Um, but that's on the rigor to make sure that he's got the right man. So if you were bringing me a parachute for the first time, I'm gonna ask you, what, what kind is it? You know, do you know when it was made? If it's a brand new one, it'll have that nice little USB uh, packing data card. But I can download them from Strong just as easily. Is there any kind of a card that we keep a log of what In each parachute, there is a packing data card. That's this one. We put them all in different locations on different parts of the container, so sometimes it's a little fun to figure out where they put it. Alright. This is the pack of data cards. And on it, it has the information about the parachute and the owner. I advise you to make sure that your information is updated on here, uh, especially the contact number, because if you happen to leave it at some contest, somebody wants to return it to you, it's nice for they have some place to go. Um, they can check and sometimes track down the rigor with the information that's on here, because we have to put our serial number and our seal on it. Um, and this is also the log of everything that's been done to your parachute, whether it's just inspect and repack, or uh, re replaced uh, steering toggles, replaced rubber bands in the container. Uh, whatever needs to be done, it's all documented on these. And sometimes you have multiples, like this one's, it got filled up. So a new one was started. And as you can see, it's getting pretty close to where I'm gonna have to start a new one here. And two years. So do they stitch a serial number somewhere in the chute? Or? Uh, it is stamped on the parachute itself, and the container itself also has a serial number. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. So we started by we started saying, hey, how many people practice actually on the mm -hmm. ground, right? I had to deploy from off white vehicle once, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I practiced that. It was completely different in flight, okay? It wasn't, you say you look, it wasn't there. You had to feel for it. So, even though you practice on the ground, what would you recommend? Like, what are we going to be faced with? We're going to be jumping on an airplane going, you know, 60 miles an hour, right? So the wind and noise and everything else, what, what's Concent different? Concentrate on what I told you. Look first. As you said, 
it moved around from where you thought it was. Because as your body shifts, as, as things are moving around, you could have loose clothing that's going to, you know, jacket that pops open that covers over the ripcord handle. So you've got to look for it. Get to it. Grab that handle, pull it straight out in front of you, and throw it away. Okay? The parachute will do the rest. Right? People ask me, how long do I have to open that parachute from the time I leave the airplane? I tell them, the rest of your life. <laughs> yes, sir. What does the extension have to pull it to actually get it? Generally, uh, about six inches from where the handle comes free and out is where it's going to start pulling the pin. Pin only has to move about an inch and a half. Okay? What foot is enough to deploy it? Huh? What foot is old enough to deploy it? Oh, more than enough. See, the pin, there's a little loop that's hold, that this pin goes through that holds. When you pull that, it pulls all three of them at the same time. And then this, you don't need this whipping around in your hand and your face. Just get rid of it. They're expensive. Yeah, you can pay 50 bucks for a new one. Sure. But unless you're an experienced skydiver who, me, I'll, I'll take mine and I'll just plug it back into my chest strap and then continue on with what I'm doing. Then I'm cheap on the rear. <laughs> and I've got 2,300 jumps, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe touch upon some of the highlights of what we should be looking at when we pre flight our shoots. Okay. If you keep your shoot in a nice bag like that, is, is nine tenths of the job. Okay. It keeps it clean, keeps it from animals, and cats can do a number on a parachute, and you will never get the smell out. <laughs> okay. Care and feeding of your parachute is one, keep it away from liquids. Even water will transfer dirt and cause problems. If you get any, any acidic material or any petroleum based product gets spilled on there, it can damage your parachute. Parachutes are made of nylon. Nylon is petroleum based. You put more petroleum on there, one, it's going to stain, two, it can actually weaken the fabric. And if it weakens the fabric, it can be patched, but there's only a certain number of patches that can be put on before you actually have to replace the whole panel. Uh, somebody drops a can of uh, gasoline on your parachute, yeah, that's going to be a fun day. Parachutes can be washed. I've taken them and taken them out and actually submerged them uh, and cleaned them off. But anyway, when you get your parachute out, you look, make sure that there's no obvious staining if you kept it free of any water and all that, you might just look to make sure that no wear has occurred. Uh, a lot of times people will take their seat cushions out of their aircraft and wear the parachute in there, and there's you know a screw or a nut that's sticking out there, and over time it starts wearing a hole into the back of the container. If you wear a hole in that, I gotta patch it. Containers are, most times, they're double layer. There's an internal parapack, and then an outside that's either parapack, parapack or cordura, both nylon materials. If it penetrates one of them, it's got to be fixed. If it penetrates both of them, you may have to replace it. And the only place you're going to be replacing that is back at the factory. OK? Um, I'll get right through in a second. Okay. Uh, when you look at the webbing, if you look at Harness webbing, you'll see that around the edges, there's a different colored thread running down the sides of it. If that thread is broken, that harness needs to be replaced. So if you've got a Velcro wearing and shredding on it, eventually you're liable to break that thread. And that's kind of the indicator we use to say, yeah, okay, that one needs to go back. It needs to be reharnessed can only be reharnessed by a master rigger or a manufacturer. So you want to try and keep all abrasive materials away from the parachute, make sure that they're, you're not getting any damage. Um, if you have a wear spot, see where on your aircraft is causing that wear spot and cover it. And even just putting a towel down may be enough to, to do that. Or get a real piece, to, you know, take a, the foam they make uh, camping bed rolls out of cut a little piece to fit, give it a little bit of a cushion. 
You want to keep that wear and tear because eventually it's going to cost you money. Okay. Yeah, so, so what's the um, work time for to do an inspection repat, and like what times of year are you like most busy? Most busy is April, May, because I take care of the flying circus. A lot of the skydiving community are now, you know, the fair weather skydivers like me. Only skydive when it's warm enough to actually feel your fingers when you land. <laughs> uh, so that's generally my big, busiest point. And then six months from then. So again in October. <laughs> Okay. The rest of that, yeah, other that gets smatterings of. It, your best bet is to try and plan a point in the middle somewhere so that you're off cycle. Everybody else. So, if you get yours over to me in March, then I'll be able to take you right away. If you wait till the 15th of April for your tax money to come in, I may have 10 or 15 rigs to do. This is not my full-time job. This is purely more of a hobby, and it's just going to happen to me when I'm the sort of work. But I'm only going to do one or two a night because it takes a couple hours of time to, from the start to finish. It'll take me an hour to two hours, depending upon what I have to do in the parachute. If it's one I'm familiar, like Paul's rig, I've packed this thing a number of times, and. Uh, it's still, even with that Paul come over, and to, so he could see exactly what goes into it, which did actually extend the time because we talked a lot. If you don't know you Paul, you can't imagine why he talked. <laughs> 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 and he can't even talk back. <laughs> um, but uh, so I usually only do one, sometimes two. I will try to meet your schedule. But don't give me the parachute on Thursday or Friday and ask to have it for Saturday morning. That's just unreasonable. Okay? Let me know ahead of time. Yes, ma'am. So over the years, I've been told the importance of, of moderate temperature. If I keep the parachute in the bag, not contaminated in any way, can it take a little freezing or very high temperature? Yes. Now, you get above the melting point of nylon, we've got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it could get up to 110, 120. Yeah? Um, yes. And I used to go camping out at, the, uh, at my drop zone, and I would take the parachute when I was done with it for the day and stick it in my car. Well, in August, it gets pretty hot. Uh, other than you know, when you put it on and those metal buckles come up and touch it, yeah, that's a different story altogether. Yes. So you're saying you, I can keep the parachute in the, in the trunk of my car all the time? You could, but the trunk of your car gets lots of other crap in it, too, I'm sure. <laughs> Again, let's go back to the contamination. You keep a quart of oil in the back of your trunk and it decides to, or transmission fluid, or brake fluid, or anything like that, it can damage it. So I recommend that you keep it in more moderate temperatures, but it will not hurt it to be in the cold. And what will hurt it is if you leave it out in the sun. Nylon and ultraviolet light are not really compatible. Ultraviolet light tends to break down the nylon, and when it does that, and I go and I do a strength test on it, and I pull it, and it goes rip. Guess what? You may have a new patch, or you may have a parachute that's condemned. So when you're not using the parachute, keep it out of the sunlight. Even if you're just if you're going to leave it in your glider while you're out talking about it, fine. Cover it with a beach towel. Just something to keep the light off it. It will extend the life of the parachute. My harness container that I use, one of my main rigs, I purchased it in 1985. It looks almost new to this day because I take care of it. It does not go out in the sunlight, except when I'm using it. And when I'm done, it goes in the gear bag. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, on that topic, are there times when you will replace the chute without a container, vice versa? Yes. If the chute is too badly damaged, or um, in some cases where an AD is put and put out that condemns that parachute, yes, we've re replaced. And then it's either you have to get the exact same one. Sometimes the manufacturer allows other parachutes than their own. To be in there. Not always. Uh, I've seen with the uh, security system where they've replaced 
the Security Arrow Conical with a preserved two parachute. It was approved by the manufacturer to do that. Unfortunately, G2 Security is no longer in business, so they can't authorize anything. So if you don't already have it done, you can't have it done. <coughs> yes, sir. So a lot of us use uh, spot locators and various other things mm -hmm. that we uh, um, do our best to fix somewhere on right. the shoot. What's your opinion on uh, people doing this? They're a pain in the butt for me, but as long as... Um, I recommend that you get with a rigger to put it on a location that's not going to be disrupted because you don't want to have that locator on and it's in a position that gets flexed and pulled apart and your nice little safety ties go ripping apart and the locator goes off somewhere and you land over there. Not doing you a bit of good. Uh, a couple of you guys I've, I've packed for that have them um, and they've been located right above the ripcord handle and that's, that's fine as long as you don't get above where the riser connects, okay? Because if, if you wrap it around the riser, it's gonna go away, <laughs> okay? Um, sometimes I've seen them down lower, but you wanna make sure that it does not interfere with you being able to get to that ripcord handle. Yes, sir. Going back to the May West, with the types of shoes that we're using, the amplitudes that we don't out yet, should we fix the May West problem or just let it go and? Yeah, say, say, repeat that, I didn't quite understand. I was thinking back to the May West. Okay, the May West, I thought you said AOS. So given the shoots that we use, the altitudes that we might exit from, the time to get to ground, should we try to fix that problem? Um, the chances of you fixing it are slim, maybe none. Um, the way to fix it is you grab the line that goes to the lower end of the lobe and pull and allow it to, get, to try and slide out from underneath. But then you're grabbing one line and another and another trying to pull so that it slides out from under that covering line. In the meantime, you're descending, you're turning, you're going wherever. You need to be paying attention to where you're landing at that point. <laughs> Chances of a Bay West going, getting any worse if left alone are pretty much nil. Chances of getting worse if you play with it increase. Okay? Losing track of time and altitude has killed more skydivers than anything else, whether in free fall or trying to fix a problem instead of lying the air. <coughs> okay? Yes, sir. I was told when, I, when you actually put the thing on, you actually should be, you shouldn't be bolt upright. You should be the mode, tilted just a little bit. Right, you should be just right. a little bit bent forward. If, but in most cases, like this parachute right here, it's not going to happen. You don't have any adjustment on this one for the main lift width. It's fixed in position. So you, all you have is the leg straps to pull down, and if you got them down and tight and you stand up and it's still loose, okay, that's what it's going to be like. Just understand what happened when he put on that rig. Saw how he kind of slouched down in it? Well, that's what's going to happen. Some of these strong seat packs have multiple adjustment points, including main lift of adjustment, the back lateral adjustment, as well as the leg straps. Combining those, you can shrink the distance in that main lift web, which allows you to be more hunched over. And yes, that does give you a much better position when you open up underneath it. As uncomfortable as it might be to stand with those, as soon as you sit down, all the weight comes off. Okay? Uh, when we put them in the stairman, they're kind of like hunched over. When they sit down, all of a sudden it's all loose. <coughs> now, if you have shoulder harnesses in your aircraft, where do you think they go in relation to where the parachute harness weapon is? The outside or the inside? Inside of it. Inside of it. The problem you can experience if you, if you have shoulder harnesses that are coming from distant points rather than a single point lying behind you is that it can tend to want to push that off of your shoulders. If you don't have the adjustable main lift web, it's more likely that that can happen. You don't want to leave the aircraft with that hanging over your shoulder. It might look a little sexy, but that's not what you want. <laughs> so if you, if you find that that is happening, make a conscious effort to make sure that, that is, those are up and not dangling down, okay? See what happens when you stand up. A lot of times they'll just correct right away, right away, okay?
be aware of that. And then the other, the other question is, uh, I was told also that if, uh, let's say that you don't do the 180 days, mm -hmm. that actually what happens is it will actually deploy slower the longer it's been in the package. Is that a wives' tale or is that? Uh, More wives' tale than anything else. Uh, I packed a parachute a couple years ago that had been in, this is a military surplus ring, that had been in that container for almost 30 years. And other than having the sharpest creases I've ever seen in a parachute, it would have worked just fine. And I pulled it, the spring jumped, and I pulled it on out just to see, and everything came out. Our bands were kind of rotted, so they broke all apart as they came apart, but that's okay. Um, it worked. The parachutes are over-designed. Um, but if you go 181 days, it's like going the next month on your annual. You, your problem will work just fine until the FAA comes to check the paperwork. Okay? So, also, people who use the parachute as a cushion, and I'm not going to get bother getting repacked, I'm just using it as a cushion, I'm not really using it as a parachute. Yeah, if you get ramp checked, that's a ramp check item. And if your parachutes have a date, you haven't marked it in off. So guess what? You're going to get violated. Doesn't happen often. More so to uh, aerobatic pilots at competition when the FAA is actually looking for the parachutes. Okay, I saw a hand. Yes. So the day you're having a bad day, what's the lowest practical altitude you could bail out and have a good chance of a shoot like this? That all depends on how fast you're going. If you're doing you know, 100 knots and you're 100 feet up and you deploy, chances are that parachute's going to open up this way, you're going to swing underneath and then plop. However, I am betting my life on that. If you're down to 100 feet and then experiencing a catastrophic failure, you're probably better off just riding it on in. Okay. Generally, things happen a little higher than that. The only times you're really that low should be when you're coming into land anyway. Okay? Now, if you have a collision with somebody in the pattern at 1,000 feet, yep, you're going to be fine if you get out right then and you have to open. At 500 feet, these things should open. They open up at, 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 if you're moving at terminal velocity, these things will open in about half a second, maybe a second. They're staged. Not really to slow down the opening, but to, to allow the opening shock to be more evenly distributed. In the old parachutes that had no diaper, the parachute would come out, open, and wait for you to hit the end of the line. And it's like the dog with the short leash. And he goes running, 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 goes to jump the fence, and that's when he reaches the end of the line. <laughs> yeah, not fun. So, so how far about 60 miles? So yeah. 70 miles an hour. I can't tell you. It, I can't tell you. It, it's going to be a matter of airspeed, altitude, your experience. I, mean, I know that I can get out of the airplane and get my parachute open faster than you can. Why? Because I'm used to getting out of an airplane and opening a parachute right then. You've got a whole lot of other things on your mind at that point, and you don't have the experience to back it up unless you're a skydiver. Yes, sir. Uh, if I should get the way, from the time you pull, how many, how much uh, uh, owls will you lose before you're actually pulling under the canopy and slow down? Well, it's 32 feet per second squared the body pulls at the stable. No, no, this is a process. So I already pulled it the, 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 the rig for it. Okay. Now the whole process is happening. If, if you are dead slow, so you're just, you're, you're at a stall point, you leave, and it's opening up, you might so be one to two control. seconds so before it opens. Okay, if you're, if you're moving along at a good clip, you will probably only drop about 100 to 150 feet before that parachute is now sitting you underneath it. And you're slowed down there. And, you're, and once the parachute is fully open and you're coming down, you're pretty much coming down at the same time. It doesn't matter if your feet are 50 feet up or 500 feet up, your descent rate is pretty much stabilized. So you're about 200 feet during the process. Approximately, yes. Even when, when I open my parachute, which I've actually slowed down a bit more for opening, I will deploy at 
2,500 feet and I'm open by like 2,300 feet. And that's moving at terminal velocity. So what, on that one question, mm -hmm. um, so for an, uh, I know there's, it's hard to say average, and, for an average safety parachute that we wear, an average pilot weight, what's the approximate equivalent earth jump from, uh, from height? Was it, you know, five feet, 10 feet? Oh, on the safety for, for the landing so under, the under a fully open canopy? Yeah. Um, uh, depending upon your weight, because that's that's going to be and, and the size of the parachute will alter. But generally, uh, equivalent to stepping off a two and a half to maybe three foot platform is pretty much at the, the top end of it. Now, if you if you're a 350 pounder and you're jumping a 20 foot the diameter parachute, yeah, it's going to be more like six or seven feet jump. Three feet for the average. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really. I heard it was a lot more than that. A lot of people get hurt because they either put their feet out and lock their knee, you know, they try and stand it up, you know, instead of hitting and rolling. If you hit and roll, it dissipates a lot of energy, a lot of energy. When I was was teaching skydiving, and we were putting people out under 24, 28 foot uh, military chutes with 24 foot military reserve parachutes. The, the step that we used to sequence it was only about this high. And we would teach them how to hit and roll. And then you come back and say, well, I'm as hard as that. Okay. But the 96 pound young lady versus the 350 pound old man under the same parachute are going to have a completely different experience when they land. Guess which one's going to hit harder? <laughs> So, so, so you decide you, know, you have to uh, bail out and mm -hmm. uh, in the glider sometimes where well, you have to remove obviously the, your seat, uh, your belts. Mm -hmm. And some of the gliders, your, 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 your feet are under the, uh, the, the, the metal structure there. Mm -hmm. uh, is it, and it's not recommended to pull the, 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 the parachute right now because you're going to hurt your feet. Are there some times that you have to do that because you're too low or? Uh, it's structure, it's structure. If you're still attached to the airplane, not attached, you are you release yeah. you from your seat belts, but somehow your legs got stuck or because it's not easy sometimes to get out of these gliders. Yeah. Okay. You wait. If if you're if you're moving at any rate of speed and that parachute comes out and inflates, it's going to stop and then the weak point in between, which is probably your legs is going to break. Okay? This is not a good thing. Well, the point is to clear the airplane before you pull the chute. Okay, clear the airplane. That's where the so practice like comes in. I've got, a, I've got a really nice picture at home. I, I should have brought it here just to show you. Uh, it shows a person who was under a static line rig. And it was one of the old military type static lines with the, uh, the four pin system. That, and he reached the end of the static line and the parachute didn't open. So he's dragging back behind. So being a student, he says, oh, I need to pull my reserve. So he pulls his reserve. So fortunately for him, the harness, the container, the static line, and everything else took all the brunt of that force. However, the picture is of the 24-foot parachute, the skydiver underneath, a static line, and a Cessna 182. <laughs> All coming down together. <laughs> yeah, it just brought that plane to a dead stop and brought it down to the ground. I, you know, everything was reusable, including the people. Um, they just got bumps and bruises. But I'll tell you, the parachute was never designed to haul an aircraft with a pilot, and I think it was a pilot, jump master, the student, and all that underneath. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, do you have any advice to offer related to landing in trees? Don't. <laughs> Don't do it. I have two tree landings. I have two tree landings. The first one was relatively uneventful down in Orange. I was under a para commander, which is a modified round parachute, high performance round. And it snagged in the trees. And I came to a halt at about five feet off the ground. Since I was close enough, I could release my main parachute and just drop to the ground, doing that nice parachute landing fall. 
We used to teach students when they had their belly wart reserves that they ended up in the tree, that they would pull the reserve, lay it, you know, drop it down like a rope, climb out of their harness, and shoot him down. We always tried to, tried to remind them they should shoot him down the outside of the parachute. <laughs> <laughs> Several of them shooting down the inside <laughs> over time. Yeah, it's, it's very embarrassing when they come to get you and you're like in a big net. Okay. Um, when you come through the trees, if you're coming down in the trees, take one foot and step it on top of the other. Branches come up. If you have a branching area, <laughs> yeah, again, it's not fun. It was not fun at all. Uh, I came down through the trees and my parachute ended up collapsing and I came down through from about 30 feet uh, in free fall, basically, because my parachute was all collapsed and I was screaming on down. And I did a parachute landing fall, hit and roll. I would have been perfectly fine if there hadn't been a half dead branch there that my foot ended up on as I rolled. So I ended up breaking a bone in my foot. I was still able to walk. But that was a 30-foot drop that I did a parachute landing fall. And even though I broke my foot, I was able to walk out of the woods. Yes, sir? Well, body position beyond the feet for trees versus power lines. Uh, military, we always talk about, you know, yes. protecting the... Yeah, protect the neck, protect the underside of the arm mm -hmm. fits because that's, again, if you get a branch that goes up under here, there's a lot of major vessels in there. It's not good. So try and keep everything tucked. This is one of the best positions. It protects your face, brings your elbows in, protect your armpits. Okay. Best bet is steer around them. <laughs> Trees, power lines are not your friends. Okay. Try and stay away from them. Um, we were talking earlier about not about losing track of what you're doing when you get on the parachute. There's a story about uh, a guy that we had who was a pilot that had to have one beaver. And we put out like eight jumpers out of the back of that. And during the climb out, as we were getting everybody in position, one guy's parachute actually deployed while he was on the step. The parachute went over the stabilizer, and he went under the stabilizer. The stabilizer did this. Okay? All the skydivers left. Because we're not dumb. <laughs> And the pilot was famous for, I don't need my parachute. You know, I just got to wear it because the FAA insists. And half the time, his leg straps were loose. The chest strap was undone. Typical of that, that's the way he had entered the aircraft. And realizing that, you know, because he could look out the door and see that the horizontal stabilizer was not doing its job anymore. And he was fighting with it. He was deciding who was going to go. So he very quickly buckled the chest strap tried to get his leg strap tight. And they actually figured out he could actually control the airplane. Beaver's a tough bird. And he brought that airplane in, landed it. And he came out, and he's walking over towards us. And we said, like, wait a minute, stop. And he said, look at this. He had buckled the chest strap through the ripcord handle. <laughs> he was preparing to leave the airplane. <laughs> With a chest strap buckled through. Now, it depends on how strong your fingers are. You might be able to grab that cable and work it out. It's not my preferred method of uh, pulling a record. And he was jumping one of these old uh, military uh, Navy backs with a 28 foot. So these things had uh, a pole strength that had to be like 28 pounds. That's really hard to get with your fingers. Okay. That's another thing with the parachutes. Depending upon the number of pins is the maximum pull strength it takes to open them. The single pin closure system, maximum is 18 pounds. Okay? This three pin system, I believe the maximum is 20, 22 pounds. With this. What happened to the guy that left first? Huh? What happened to the guy that uh, started the event? Uh, well, he disconnected from his main parachute, which is oh. what caused the damage, and fired his reserve and landed just fine. And actually, the parachute had very little damage to it. You never mind the most damaged aspect. 
then uh, the pilot's ego. <laughs> um, okay, anything else? Any other questions? Yes, sir. So where can we find you on the web and what's your phone number? <laughs> um, Joe at callenweb.com, C A L L E N W E B dot com. And my cell number is 703 625 7050. Is there a directory of riggers? I'm like in Baltimore or anything great. I know there's um, not Dave up in Harper County, but Dave. He's, uh, he flies for Lance up there in Harper County. Okay, I don't know if recognize that. <coughs> um, Is there a directory of The FAA has airman records of who has rigger tickets, not necessarily who is actually an active rigger. Right. Uh, Orange uh, Skydiving Center has published. A list of riggers, and they, they you know, ask you if you want to be on the list, and I'm on that list uh, for people. But generally, you find through word of mouth who's around and who does, you know, pilot rates. So some some of the newer riggers don't do pilot emergency rates. Why? Ninety percent of the skydivers are only using square parachutes. Most of them do not even have round parachutes in the reserves anymore. They have square reserves. So a lot of them don't feel comfortable doing. The, Rounds. Now, I started skydiving in 1979, so I trained on the rounds. I got my first set of ratings on rounds. And basically, there, there's three main rigor ratings, back, chest, and seat, that are used. There's also a chair rating, which is almost unheard of nowadays. Uh, for these rigs, a back rating is all that's necessary. Some of them actually say back or chest, even though it's a back rating. The, the manufacturer gets to the side deck. The seat ones, though, almost always have to be done by a seat rigger. I have all three of those ratings. Yes. Um, but if you have a rigger that you use now and you you feel great about them and all, stay with them. It's best to have a rigger you know and trust than someone you don't know anything about. Unfortunately, there are some riggers out there who their primary tool is a pencil. And those are not the ones you want. If a rigger won't let you dump the parachute, as I demonstrated here, run, do not walk to the next rigger. Okay? Please don't bring it to me, dump like that, because I need to be able to control the environment that that parachute's in so that I know that it hasn't been dragged through the dirt and anything like that through oil and everything else. It takes me a whole lot longer to go through a full body inspection again on it if it's been dumped previously. If you get an accidental deployment as you're point coming out of the airplane, and or a student goes, oh, what does this child handle today? Yeah. <laughs> Contain the, the mess as quickly as you can, put it back into the container bag, and then bring it to me. Do not attempt to close it up yourself. You are not a rigger. Rigger signs his name to that and puts a seal on it. If that seal's broken, it's no longer airworthy until that seal's replaced. Okay? And it should be the rigger who did it. Yeah, if you bring me an accidentally put where like one pin is gone and the other, I'll refix it and close it back up for you, and I won't even charge it for it. If I have to repack it, yeah, okay, then you're gonna charge for it. Okay? Um, it is good every once in a while to switch out the riggers. Helps keep them honest. So, and I have no feeling if you want to take mine, you can take it up to David Wolf up in Maytown. Probably one of the best master riggers on the East Coast. He's in fact, he's the parachute rigger examiner. In fact, that's where I learned the parachute. The parachute. By all means, go do so. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Post landing, how do you want to clean up? Try not to drag it through the mess. Try and daisy chain the lines together to uh, keep them from getting all knotted up. And then just pick it all up carefully, put it into a large trash bag, close it up, bring it to me. If there's you know, stickers and brush in there and you can pick them out without dragging them through, please do that too. Um, I've had parachutes come back from cornfields, through briar patches. Yeah, those take a lot more time to clear out. Okay. Right? Yes, sir. So, I'm in the market for a shoe. Mm -hmm. I just asked, what would your recommendation be? 
I recommend uh, well, well, the strong the parachutes. The question was, um, weigh 150 pounds, and that's for a parachute recommendation. Yeah, if you were to get to a national system, um, any of those in the, the lower end, you don't, the Phantom 24, Phantom 26, and Phantom 28, you could do very well with the 24. Are you the only one who's going to be using that parachute? Most likely. Then go for the lighter, smaller one for your weight. You can, you can use any of them. I would go for the lightest, most comfortable fitting one. Nationals fit very well. Uh, Strongs, uh, they generally are all in the 26 foot range, which gives you a lot of variety. The bigger the parachute, the softer you're going to come down. That's about all. Okay. Um, Butler Systems makes a really good system. If you're, if you're using seat packs, I would go either with Strong or Butler. Uh, if you're using a back system, National is also very good. Uh, paraphernalia, so the softy systems are good. When you say seat pack, the seat pack, you're talking about can you sit on? Or yes, yes. The parachute is actually from yeah. your knees We're, to your butt. So we do have a uh, version, but we actually have the, the chute actually comes around your butt. Yeah, that's it's <coughs> kind of a hybrid right. where the, the parachute is packed within the whole confines. If that's fine for you, you with seat packs, you tend to get raised up higher, so if you don't have the canopy clearance, you don't want a seat pack. If you don't have a lot of front back, it's better to have a seat pack because they're very, very thin on the back. Those, um, what they call the long softy, is one of those. Um, they kind of <coughs> meets in the middle, and so you're not really getting raised up that much, and you're not getting pushed that much forward. It's still a bit forward, but. Are there any uh, detriments to that type of shoe? You know, or is the From functionality, no, it matters not. Is more of a comfort factor at that point. What fits your aircraft and your body? Okay. Um, I don't have anything for them. I'm just going to talk for a little while. Um, that's a that's a tough act to follow. I mean, he brought in props, a parachute, and everything. I, I was wondering while I was sitting back there, what kind of props a designated pilot examiner could bring. Like, I don't know. What I'm, I'm, I can hand out pink slips if you guys want. <laughs> so uh, a ruler with a hit. So I've been uh, I've been uh, in gliders since 1986. I started when I was 14 years old. I sold when I was 15. And uh, when I became an instructor in 2003. Um, I uh, gave a lot of instruction to Skyline Soaring Club, the, uh, the club to the south, as you guys are probably familiar. Uh, I uh, know Dave Weaver, he's the guy who got me through my instructor rating uh, way back in 2003, and uh, also Coley Lombard was in our club uh, back during that time too. Um, so Marvin started uh, talking about how badly he wanted to retire and not give any more check rides, uh, since I seemed to be the guy who would always get all the students in Skyline uh, through the final push to get their ratings. Marvin had a little talk with me and said, well, I'd really love to retire and I think you'd be a great pilot examiner. So I'm also the chief instructor for Skyline Soaring Club, so we had our little instructor caucus and we all got into a room and I said, I need somebody to volunteer who's qualified uh, to become the pilot examiner. And everyone took one step back. <laughs> I was the only guy standing forward, so I got stuck with the job. Um, so a little bit about how it, um, how you have to go about getting your uh, designation. Uh, the designated pilot examiner is not a special rating issued by the FAA. It is merely a token that the local flight standard district office gives to you. So, um, so basically I'm being managed as a uh, freelance, independent, unpaid contractor by the FAA. I only have two jobs, and that's to give out commercial pilot check rides for the practical test and private pilot check rides for the practical test. So people like to joke around, oh, a guy from the FAA is here. That's not the case at all. I'm just a regular guy who is allowed to give up check rides um, in, on the FAA's behalf. Um, my, uh, my, my region is the Washington Fisdale region, which is basically all of Northern Virginia and the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Uh, it's one of the smaller regions in the US. There's only one soaring club within that. Uh, that's Skyline Soaring. Uh, two, if you want to count the operation out in St. Mary's. Um, in order for me to do a check ride outside of my region, I need to have special permission. So if anybody from this club uh, needs to get a check ride for a private pilot or a commercial, um, 
practical test, I would have to go to my FISDO and say, Mother, may I? Uh, please give a check right outside of my region. And then there's all sorts of paperwork involved. So if, you, if you're going to get a check ride this Saturday, and you call me up on Thursday, there's no chance that's happening. I need seven working days, at the very minimum, to get all the FAA paperwork in place for me to do a check ride outside of the region. If you want me to do a check ride inside the Washington FISDO, like if you bring your two-seat glider down to Front Royal, I'd be happy to do it without that much notice. But that seems like a lot of, a lot of burden on your part. What it takes to become a pilot examiner. So, and so for me, it was a five-year journey. It was a lot longer than it takes most people to go through. Um, I started my journey in 20, uh, 2011. Yeah, 2010. It was 2010. It was August of 2010. Um, and I submitted a piece of paper, basically like an 8710, which is what you um, fill out for your pilot rating. But it's a special one for designees. So you send this off to Oklahoma City, and it sits in a file for six months, and then twice a year, a bunch of people called the National Examiner Board get together, and they look over all these, basically, resumes um, of pilot history. And they say, this guy is qualified, this guy is qualified, this guy is not qualified. And then they send me a piece of paper, and then it's going to sit there, unless you're actively working with your uh, FISDO to become a pilot examiner. So if your FISDO has no interest in making you a designee, it's not ever going to happen. So I went through about four years and a couple of uh, these 8710-10 forms being sent in until it got to the point that Marvin came to us and said, look, I'm not going to be able to do this forever. You guys need to get moving here. So uh, yeah, we started sending, a, it was like a letter writing campaign. Everybody in the club was like sending letters to the FISDO. We need to have an examiner. We need to have an, exa an examiner. And then, uh, well, finally we got them uh, to make some movement on it. And then their office manager left. Another guy came in. <laughs> So, like five years later, I finally get the go-ahead from the office. They say, go ahead and do your training down to Oklahoma City. So I flew down to wonderful scenic Oklahoma City, and I sat in the FAA's uh, training class for new designated pilot examiners. And there were uh, 13 other guys in that class. And, uh, you know, it was a big U-shaped table, and I was sitting at one end. And, and when they got the class started, they said, okay, uh, go around the room and introduce yourself. So the first guy was like a... You know, an airline pilot, you know, 20,000 errors or something like that, and, and another professional pilot, another professional pilot, and a guy who ran a 141 school for 20 years, gets around to me, the last guy in the class. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a glider instructor, and I'm going to be giving check rides for gliders, and I don't even have a medical. <laughs> I was clearly the lowest guy at the totem pole in that room, and they, they reminded me throughout the whole class. but. So the class was basically learning all about six, Part 61. Uh, that was really exciting and challenging. And, uh, it, and wasn't then, yeah, it really wasn't. <laughs> and uh, how to give a check ride. And the last two days of the, of the uh, training were role playing for how to give a check ride. And uh, the FAA has really changed a lot of a lot of the ways that they're doing their uh, their their check ride preparation. And they really want the examiners to focus more on giving situations for uh, for the check rides ground portion. So, <coughs> Uh, if you're going to go through a check ride, expect me to have more like a conversation rather than me asking you questions that I'm expecting short rote answers for. Uh, so I may ask you, uh, so you're going to be landing in a field, and this field has a, a big tower on this end and it has nothing on the other end, but the wind's going this way and the slope <laughs> goes that way, tell me what you would do. It's more like a conversation rather than a, oh, it's going upslope depending on the wind. I don't want rote answers, so we're talking more like a conversation. And it's supposed to be really low key. You're not supposed to, uh, uh, when you're giving a check ride, you're not supposed to make a tense environment. So I try very hard to keep it all very, I mean, it's all, it's all very stressful. Like they said during the, the check ride training, any pilot can fail any check ride. Uh, so I mean, it's, a, it's more like a conversation, and, and uh, we'll go through a written plan of action. Um, that's another thing that they want to really make sure that I follow is a plan of action so I won't get distracted and forget about the things that I'm going to talk about during the check ride, and I get all the, the things checked off that they need, need me to, to check off on the check ride. Just a minute. So um, for the practical tests, um, I am bound to give the check ride that the FAA wants. I cannot make up my own check ride. 
I can't be like, uh, well, I'd like to see my commercial kids do a barrel roll and final. I can't come up with anything like that. I gotta, I gotta go by the book. Yeah. And if, if they find me giving things that are in excess of the PTS, they'll take away my designation, and that week I spent in Oklahoma City will all be wasted. I don't want to do that. So I'm gonna follow the rules of how they, how they watch me. They have, a, they have to watch me uh, give an exam once a year. They're there to observe me and not to observe the candidate. I know that's got to be even more stressful, as if the stressful experience of getting a check ride wasn't bad enough. Now they have an FAA guy watching the examiner give the check ride. And then if the student gives like a questionable answer, the examiner looks over at the FAA guy and is like, oh, I don't know. No, it's not like that at all. The guy's watching me to make sure that I'm using a written plan of action, to make sure that I'm not doing anything in excess of the PTS. And one of the funny things about gliders is they only have two seats. So the examiner, he can't like sit on my lap in the back seat of 233. There's no room for that. So he just takes my word for it and says, go have a good time. So we don't put a GoPro in the plane. So basically the, the check ride during the flying portion is all just me and the candidate. Um, and the only person, the only time that I'm observed by the FAA is on the ground portion, so. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so usually a check ride uh, always contains two parts. It contain, uh, contains the ground portion and the flying portion. Uh, previous to that, there's a, a pretest briefing where I'll go through your logbook, make sure that your logbook is all <coughs> ready to go, make sure that you have all the endorsements. The endorsements I need to see are um, one that you're ready to take the check ride from an instructor. Two, this is the one that everyone messes up. I need to make sure that you have an arrow toe launch endorsement. And that's kind of weird, but 6131 requires you to have arrow toe launch uh, endorsement or what other launch method you're going to be using. I presume you're going to be doing an arrow toe launch method. Um, and uh, I also need to make sure that you have the right amount of time in your logbook so that you have the minimum number of flights, the minimum number of, of uh, hours uh, that you've logged around instruction for all the areas that's required under the Part 61. I'll go through a pretest briefing talking about what's going to happen during pretests. And uh, there's no doubt when the test starts because the, set, the test has begun. Those, once those words are dropped, there's only three outcomes of that test. You're going to pass, you're going to fail, or something's going to break and we're not going to be able to continue. And those are all things that are covered during the pretest briefing. You know, very clear when it starts, very clear when it ends. If there's something that goes wrong during practical tests, uh, I'll let you know immediately. And then it, the student has, or the candidate has the opportunity to continue the test if he's so precious. If he doesn't want to continue the test, then he can say, I'm done, too emotionally disturbed, uh, disturbed by this. And he can cancel it. It's no problem, either way. You schedule it within 60 days. You get credit for all the parts you covered. And we only have to redo the parts that weren't covered. Uh, the notice of discontinuance is if the uh, tow plane breaks, I get sick, the candidate gets sick, the glider is not usable, uh, the weather came in, something like that. You can't start a check ride on a day when uh, the weather is expected not to be good enough to uh, do the test. So if it's going to be socked in, gray all day, I can't say we're going to do the ground portion and it's clear we're not going to fly today, can't do anything like that. Um, if I start the test, I have to have the expectation that the test is going to be continued and completed on that day. <coughs> um, the items that I cover on the test are strictly what's in the PTS. A great book for um, doing all the material. So how many people are going to be taking a check ride in the next two years? Are there any students in here? Oh, I'll see you guys later. <laughs> so, uh, so if you want to know the book that's going to get you, um, the, the, the thing that I use to prepare my students when I was giving check rides is that Bob Wander practical test made easy. And, and what I did for all the check rides that I did when I was a student is I created it just like a, uh, you know, flashcards. Uh, each, each one of the items in the PTS is covered in lots of detail in that book. And if you know that book back and forth, if every page has been turned and everything's got wrinkled and it's got highlight markers on it, and it's, you know, every page has been read and, and loved and, and memorized, man, those are the people who have the easiest times on the check ride. The people who have the worst times on the check ride are usually the guys who are transition pilots and say, ah, it's just gliders, there's no problem, I can do a glider, no problem. <laughs> These guys are actually a little bit more difficult on the ground portion than the guys to really obsessively study all the material ahead of time. There's no reason to really study that stuff and memorize everything you wrote, because remember, it's a conversation during the check ride. It's not, it's not your ability to regurgitate the facts that are reported in Bob Wander's book or in the uh, Part 61. That's not nearly as interesting to me, and that's not nearly as important to the FAA, is making sure that you guys are actually 
um, fully trained by everything that's in the PTS, and most of all, going to be a safe pilot when you become a pilot. The last thing I want to do is sign someone off after a check ride, give him his pilot's license, and then two weeks later he goes and crashes it in the trees. I can't imagine anything more awful to me because then I'll come back and think, man, maybe that was something that I just missed in the check ride. Maybe I didn't ask him that question about uh, what happens when you fly too slow when you're on final. You know, I don't want to go through that. So it's my personal sign off that this guy is going to be safe enough to fly with uh, people off the street or more importantly, my personal thing is that if I feel like this person could fly one of my kids or my, my, uh, my family members and I would feel safe with him flying together, that's pretty much the, the standard that I personally use. If I can't imagine this guy flying with anybody, then, um, then you won't make it. So uh, uh, I think that's pretty much what I want to say. I'm really interested in what questions you guys have. I was just going to get comments since I you know, sat with you for the check ride. And that the world course was really kind of neat because it wasn't like a stump the chump type of experience. So all the questions I think that we went through and everything were all applicable to the flying day for the conditions that we had. Right. And that was really, really kind of cool. Right. So uh, the question was, or the statement was is that it's not a game of stump the chump. I'm, you know, I'm not the most smart person in the world, and I don't ask questions that I already know the answer to. That's like the first thing they taught me in the FAA school. Don't ask a question as an examiner that you aren't able to answer yourself. <laughs> so, uh, it's, you know, I got really goofy. I don't, that was kind of a hallmark of, of Marvin's check rides, and that's something that I don't incorporate, and that's, uh, that's uh, uh, you know, asking these really weird off-the-wall questions that just stump everybody, and then afterwards all the instructors are like, I, I don't really answer that question. So uh, I don't know, what, I don't know, Marvin had some goofy thing like mm -hmm. having a variometer unplugged but hanging out the window and it was a pedo source on the very, I don't know. Was, like, I won't ask goofy questions like that. I'm pretty much by the PTS guy. I'm not creative enough to come up with goofy questions like that. Yeah. How about flight instructors? Can you examine them or where do we get that done? That's a good question. So the question is, uh, what about flight instructors? So currently I only have on um, my uh, COA, uh, Certificate of Authorization within my physical region, the ability to do commercial and private check rides. But um, what's going to happen is if you go to your FISDO and say, I have somebody who has an initial check ride for an instructor, uh, the FISDO is going to do their work to find somebody who can do that check ride. And they're going to look at my COA and say, eh, he's not ready for an instructor yet. Or uh, we're really desperate and we're going to get this P pilot barber guy to do this check ride. <laughs> so, um, so one of those two situations is going to happen. Um, so I haven't been asked to do an instructor check ride yet, and when that day comes, they'll give me a special briefing uh, to, to, to make an amendment to my COA to allow me to do uh, a flight instructor We have to go to the Pennsylvania FISDO to get that, like to get, not through your right. And one of the other things is the FAA really doesn't like to have initial first-time flight instructor rides by DPE, especially by a young guy who just started becoming a DPE. Um, they'll get a, a FAA guy, an inspector, to come down. Uh, Steve Brown, Stephen Brown is up in Boston. He's the only guy on the East Coast who doesn't. Or they'll fly out one of the three guys on the West Coast who does uh, check rides for initial gliders. Um, and they can make they can make exceptions for that. The, the guy um, uh, John Malumphy did an initial CFI check ride just last December. So if they have to, they can. Yes. So Pete, just an update: if you're taking the FERC from the Surface Safety Foundation. Glenn or I can actually issue a renewal. We have ACR authorization. Right. So we can't do it a brand new one, but if you've got a certificate, we can give you your, your next temporary. So I'll keep you going. Right. Yes. Uh, there's a new the ACS standard for uh, airplanes. That's right. Is in effect. That's right. I don't think it's in effect for gliders. It's not. It hasn't been written yet. Can you? Oh, okay. Can okay. You discuss so that the ACS, the FAA has come up with a. Uh, you know, they said the PTS. Was, was an acronym that everyone's learned to memorize, and, and the tests, and all the books have been written out there for PTS, and the FAA has to mix things up a little bit. So they're changing everything to the Airman Certification Standard. And that is, uh, it's been, so the FAA has come up with a new way of writing the PTS and giving it a new name. And the ACS is more integrated with the written test. So when you, when you have items on the written test that you didn't get right, the ACS has the same code on the written test as it has on the ACS. So right now, if you take your written test and you miss three or four questions, you'll get a goofy little code like PLT159. And then when I see your written test, I have to go look up that PLT159 and find out that that's you know, navigational for a map or whatever that code is. So the ACS, one of the nice things about it is that ACS code um, 
is going to be uh, on the, the new version of the practical test standard. It's going to be the same number as on the written test about the items that are required in the practical test, uh, the ACS. It's only been written for two practical tests now. That's for the airplane and the, uh, the airplane private ASEL and the instrument um, ASEL uh, for private. Hasn't been for any others. They have, the FAA, as I understand it, hasn't even picked out the, uh, the, the, the people who know enough about gliders to help write the new airman certification standards for the gliders. And I don't expect them to have it for another two or three years for gliders. So if you're already ready and you've got your PTS ready to go, man, keep, keep plowing along with that PTS. Don't worry about the ACS yet. When that comes out, I'll let you guys know um, that the, the practical test is going to be done with an ACS instead of a PTS. I guarantee it's going to be commercial instrument and ATP before they get to the gliders. Yeah, the gliders are probably going to be the last thing, maybe it's before be power lift. Five years out, right? yeah. the FS600 told me. They, they won't even start for two years. Yeah. So I would, that's, that's a future peak problem. That's not a big problem. <laughs> yeah. So if, if you're out of our region, do we have someone in region now, or, or do we not? There's nobody that in the, position now? There's nobody in the Harrisburg. Uh, that, that's your the Harrisburg region. Yeah. Somewhere, right? There's nobody. Uh, so there's there. no problem with you coming up there? Nope. Because they just nope. they know there's no one else around. So when, when Marvin know. allowed his designation to expire on July 31st of last year, <laughs> he gave me a list of all the airports and all the clubs uh, where he does check rides. And that's in the ball, Baltimore Fizda region and the Harrisburg Fizda region. Let's just for what it's worth, you might want to talk, have your your Dulles guys talk to the BWI guys or Harrisburg guys and try to get a, a letter that so you don't have to do that ad hoc every seven days. And, All right, because they'll do that, especially yeah. since you know, Harrisburg doesn't have anybody, mm -hmm. BWI doesn't have anybody, <laughs> and there's a need to do it. So I, I would recommend or encourage you to consider doing it. Right. And the guys at Dulles will have no problem with that. And I know BWI and Harrisburg, that okay. no way they don't have to worry about juggling things all the time. Right. So. There used to be an FAA guy named Frank Phillips who yep. was uh, giving uh, check rides a lot. Is he still active? He still gives check rides very actively, but he has no interest in doing any gliders. Uh -huh. um, I remember, yeah. what, two weeks ago, the last uh, seminar, webinar, uh, Stephen said there's only 28 gliders. DPEs in the country. Yeah, that number was very generous. Yeah. Um, so and I got together with necessarily all active. I think it was six FAA. Right. So I got together with Frank Whiteley, and we came up with a list of. We basically asked in the SSA clubs email list, anybody who's had a check ride at all within the last year, say the guy's name, and then I made a list of all the designated pilot examiners in the U.S. And then I looked them up in the FAA's database to make sure that he was actually. But the FAA said that guy was an examiner. And then I checked him up on the SSA, and I came up with a nice uh, Google Sheets spreadsheet with all the examiners. And I think the number is like, it's around 20. Okay. So, and uh, we give uh, all the examiners in the country give about 180 to 200 check rights per year. So if you're given 10, then that's like 5% of all the check rights <laughs> in the country. So that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, I was just going to mention another nice thing about working with you that I like was that um, post check ride and everything. Um, we talked about everything that happened, including you know, um, But in the email, I got a really, really nice follow up uh, from you that was a, kind of another written debrief that explained sort of what happened that day, what to do so it's minimized, but then also what to do next, which I thought was really, really slick. Okay. One of the things that they were really uh, concerned about in the Oklahoma City is, is that, and this is something that's bitten the FAA recently, um, all the people who become pilot examiners are flight instructors, and it is really hard for this guy to stop teaching, because I love teaching, and I love getting that like, light bulb moment in your brains. And then the day that I show up an examiner, I'm not a teacher anymore. And during that check ride, I'm not a teacher, and I'm not able to give any instruction. I mean, there's just tons of kind of, it's, yeah, that's the hardest part about being examiner, is not just telling you how to do it right, do it my way, right? <laughs> So, uh, so that's what the post-flight uh, briefing is about. I give, uh, give a, a confidential assessment of how the test went, what you can do better, what you did really well at. Um, and that's, that's where I'm saving up all that instructor needs to say these things the instructor <laughs> needs to get out. That's for after the check, right? Yeah, and the email I got was no less than 10 paragraphs. So it was <laughs> Having you know, having not come to the 
I got experience before. It was really, really cool to see that email in my inbox. Um, after you, after you. <laughs> you don't have to impress me anymore. You already passed. You're sort of like a new commodity. I think I'm a first tech writer. That's right. Right. I'm not sure if many people have been working with it. It was really it slick. Right. So I'm, yes. sorry, I'm sorry for my commercial, right? No problem. I know that someone is uh, taking the commercial test, and there are actually questions on Navate. Uh -huh. uh, is that, I mean, what, what's your thinking on that? All right, so do you have an airplane rating? Yeah, I do. Okay. So um, at the beginning of your PTS, there is a matrix, and it says, you already have this rating, and you're going for this rating. Mm -hmm. And then it has a list of all the items in the PTS that have to be covered. Mm -hmm. And as I seem to recall, somebody who has an airplane commercial who's applying for a glider commercial doesn't have to go through uh, the section that talks about navigation. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I can't talk about it, right. but I don't, I don't have to do that if I don't have the time or anything like that. That's one of the nicer things about an add-on rating is, is that for all the stuff that you're already good at in airplanes, I don't have to talk about it in glider, so I don't have to ask you about uh, what happens when you're on an outbound course, which way should the ADF mute be pointing on an outbound course when you got a right cross, none of that goofy stuff. <laughs> what about the power license? And you're only going for a commercial glider license if, if you, you don't have a commercial pilot. Right, so the question is, if you have a pilot, private ASEL and you're going for a commercial glider and you don't have a commercial ASEL, then I will give you an initial commercial check ride and we'll cover the entire PTS from start to finish. Uh, yeah, and that little matrix doesn't count at all because you're going up a grade. So it doesn't mean you have to get a commercial airplane first. It doesn't mean you have to get a com uh, private glider first. You can go straight from airplane private to a commercial glider, but you go through the whole PTS, you don't get any credit for the sections uh, in the front of the PTS for that uh, completion matrix. <clears throat> I've exhausted all the questions. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Okay. I think people just want to get out of here. <laughs> 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 Alright. go first because they were nice enough to take a day out of their time and drive up here and everything. So one more round of applause and we both <laughs> And then I didn't think this was going to be uh, controversial at all, but uh, <laughs> no, the first one. That is the first one. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, but anyway, we, we sent out, the, the board sent out uh, the two bylaw changes that we wanted to do. The first one was the honorary member change, and the second one was the uh, associate associate member. So, this basically the, the gist of it is that we have members, uh, the honorary members, I think we have four of them right now. Glenn can tell me if I'm wrong. But, uh, well, I haven't been on the board for years. <laughs> You've done me. Yeah, well, the four that I know are Jim Trigg, Val Brain. I think we had some other safety oh. meeting speakers you had to go. I think Lance put something together. No, 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 we're not done with safety meeting. Okay. Yeah. We just took cool. the business stuff. Okay. Yeah, I know. Like, like I said, I wanted to get the, the two guys first. Uh, I want to get back to this. Uh, the four honorary members I know of are Jim Trigg, uh, Hope Howard, Ray Watson, and uh, Val Brain. George Sims. George Sims. George Sims. Okay, yeah, and, and, I, and I apologize to George if I didn't get him down on the list. I think but Gordon Heidelbeck, too, way back. Is he an honorary member, too? I think they did that a long time ago. Okay, I didn't know that. Um, but go, go to the next slide. <laughs> the, the gist of it is that every one of these people have long, uh, long involvement with the club. They've done a lot of... Uh, Good, great things. In fact, uh, Jim Trigg, we, we know most of his uh, his accomplishments because he's still doing it. Every legal item that we have, we run by Jim. He's written the uh, access agreements. Uh, when we came up with the recent access agreement, we sent that by him. He still works with the state of Pennsylvania. If you look through all these things, he uh, he helped get us a two hundred thousand uh, dollar grant. He, I mean, he should have been a, a uh, an honorary member. 
just for negotiating with the tree lady, if anybody's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that right there is, is more than enough. He was um, actually the last person she would talk to. <laughs> the, the only one. Well, what yeah, I said. The only one. That's right, yeah. So, uh, I mean, we could have been shut down if we wouldn't have bought that little section of, of uh, land. So let, let's go uh, let's go down the next next slide. And then Hope Howard, uh, when I was on the board about 20 years ago, she actually hosted all board meetings at her house. She was membership chairman for forever, I think was the, the term. Uh, Ray Watson was our uh, manager of duty schedule for, for a long time. He actually wrote the uh, program that makes it possible for everyone to get the weekends off if they want, <laughs> DOD on the, on the weekends that they want. Uh, Val Brain's been chief flight instructor, contest pilot. He still uh, keeps all the uh, supplies in, in our uh, uh, club room. And then he, he volunteers at the uh, Region 4 North contest. So all of these guys have, uh, all these members have paid annual dues for literally decades. I think Val joined the club before I was born. <laughs> if, if, if I have it right, it was in the 50s. So all we were doing was we wanted to change this so that they could, uh, they basically had all the, all the rights that a typical full, full member would have. So if you go to the next, uh, next slide. If you can read this, it's basically it says, honorary membership is a classification awarded by the board of directors to those members who have made significant contributions to Mass over many years as active members. Their flying careers are mostly behind them, but they wish to continue to offer support for the club based on their experience. In recognition, the board has unanimously voted to seek membership approval for a change in our bylaws, and that's the section. And then go, go to the next uh, slide. And then the current, current thing says, uh, uh, basically, honorary members are not entitled to vote, hold office, or use corporation equipment. The uh, proposed description, which, which I sent out to everybody, says, uh, Basically, they're long-standing members of MASA who perform substantial services for the benefit of MASA. Honorary members shall enjoy all the privileges and benefits of a full, full member, shall not pay annual dues. So there was a, uh, a ballot that was sent out. And my understanding from Holland is that it's very close. So the best way to do this is to actually have a vote of hand on uh, Oh, well, he did the ballot. Sorry? No, no, no. no. There, there was, no. most of the people who brought ballots in turned them in, and, and we looked at them, but that was not an official vote. It, it kind of gave us an idea what, what was going on. The official vote is, would be no. 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 Pardon me? It wasn't all. No, that's not wrong. Yeah. Are we allowed to make amendments to this? Amendments to? To your, your uh, text. <laughs> not that I know. The, the way I read the rules, uh, there, there's a time period, and, and I don't want to get the exact or the wrong number, but there's so many days, it has to be sent out to the membership, which is what we did before this meeting. So I don't know that we can actually change it at the meeting. I, I don't know if it Well, you're changing the way you're voting. Pardon me? You're changing the way you're voting. What do you mean I'm changing it? You, you sent written ballots out. Mm -hmm. what, what yeah. I you want to the ground yeah. Well, we can stick. We can do the ballot. Has everybody turned in their ballot? Yeah, yeah. Okay, then have everyone turned. What's it take to pass? Two thirds, right? Pardon me. Two thirds to pass. I thought it was single majority. That's for sure. No. I think two thirds. I think it's a majority, but I'm looking at it. Okay. Can we finish the discussion? Yes. It'll be good for the co-pilots, it'll be good for the co-pilots, and 
the uh, in, in the uh, glider pilots. Okay. So uh, uh, so basically, we got uh, uh, got uh, from the other end of the uh, tow rope from what you guys are usually uh, used to. And just let me go over the current uh, qualified tow pilots. We've got Bob Andrew, Jim Check, Glenn Collins, Gordon Daniel, Buddy Devon, uh, Wayne Elson, Willie Hackett, Mike Higgins. PA 18 only is going to hopefully get uh, ready and be able to fly the uh, Pawnee here pretty soon. But we're trying to get it. We've got to get a uh, high performance endorsement for him. Bob Jackson, Bill Cutter, and uh, myself, uh, Mike Smith, and Pete uh, Wells. So, uh, uh, anyway, we've got a great group of, of pilots. We've had a good record the last few years. We haven't damaged any equipment. Let's try to keep it uh, the same. <laughs> Everybody knows that uh, it's very expensive when we start damaging equipment. So, so and, and these airplanes are getting old. So anytime anybody's around any of the airplanes, see anything that they don't quite like, bring it up to the tow pilot, or bring it up to me or, or Mike or someone, so so we can uh, take attention to it because because like I say, they are getting old. Um, we got a few more members in the pipeline, and uh, springtime. Anybody that that is in the pipeline. Uh, Contact me. Springtime is the best time to work on the tow pilot qualification. We all get busy in the summertime and it gets hot and, and whatnot. But, but I'm not real keen about being in the back seat of the Super Cub when it's below freezing. So <laughs> <laughs> the heater works good up front, but in the back seat, not so, not so much. Anyone who's interested, please uh, review the operations manual, uh, manual for the club requirements. And you can contact me at uh, my email. Uh, there's a flight time summary in the operations manual that you can fill out, and it's all available online. Uh, and uh, uh, authorized tow pilots to work with uh, myself, Bob Jackson, Mike Smith, and, and Willie Hackett uh, can, can fly with you guys. Uh, we'll look, just look at some of the things in the operations manual. I just highlighted a few items uh, as, as I went through. Uh, it's not a complete review, so if you want to look over the complete section, uh, it's all online. But uh, basically, it starts on page five, uh, section seven, uh, mass aero tow procedures, and uh, yeah, yes. So, so the, the first line in the whole section is tow pilots, glider pilots, best friend without uh, pilots willing to tow, none of us would get off the ground. So, so we always want to keep that in mind when we uh, uh, with our with our tow pilots and. and uh, uh, you get out there on a hot summer day, and you're and you're you know in the airplane from from morning till night. It gets pretty it gets pretty hot and it gets pretty tiring. So anybody that can you know other tow pilots that can jump in and, and relieve some of these guys as they get dehydrated and so forth, uh, by all means we, we, we need the help. Uh, putting the airplanes away is another one that we need help with, and, and just cleaning them down at the end of the day. That's when you find a lot of uh, problems with airplanes is when you just cleaned it down. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about towing limitations, towing qualifications, and then uh, we'll get tow responsibilities and, and some guidelines. Uh, we have FARs to, we have to comply with as well. FAR 161, 69 is written out here. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but <laughs> uh, if you want to, it, it kind of makes me dizzy. So, uh. <laughs> but what you have to remember as a tow pilot, you've got to remember within 24 calendar months. Uh, before the flight, you have to have uh, made at least three actual or simulated glider tows while accompanied by a qualified pilot who meets the requirements of this section. So that's got to be a, a logbook entry uh, every 24 months, or made at least three flights as pilot in command of a glider towed by an aircraft. Of course, prior to this, you've had mm -hmm. the tow pilot endorsement in, in your logbook. But once you have that, then this is the currency requirements required by the FAA. Then, the, then MASA requirements, we also have uh, uh, recurrent training uh, spelled out in the operations manual. Uh, tow pilot recurrency uh, training is conducted on bi biennial cycle regardless of other flight checks. Uh, if desired, it may be conducted in conjunction with a uh, flight review. So every two years, uh, one of us has to fly with, with, with each of the tow pilots and, uh, and go through the curriculum. First hours for free, additional flight times uh, with the uh, Massa Super Cub rental program. But yeah, it's, it's basically one hour of free time uh, for you to go out and practice uh, whatever, you, whatever you're, you feel you need to. Stalls, air work is always a good thing, and, and then takeoffs and landings, of course, 
is always a, uh, a good place to, uh, to start that. Please check. So please check your logbooks for current VFR. And last time you flew with me, Bob, uh, Mike Smith, or uh, uh, Willie, and make sure that we, we get that in there every on a uh, every two year basis. So basically, our uh, um, uh, our insurance requirement doesn't have an hour requirement anymore. It has will will comply with NASA uh, rules. So so we've got to have all that stuff for our for our insurance to actually be uh, uh, be binding. Try to schedule with me uh, or one of us as soon as uh, weather allows. So best time to do this is early in the spring as the weather starts to clear up and we can get out there and get, 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 get guys uh, uh, flying. Tow pilot responsibilities. Uh, <clears throat> tow pilot's responsible for safety and proper operation of the tow plane and launch operations. Tow pilot shall arrive at the field and be ready to start towing at 10. Uh, and uh, under certain circumstances, as all you know, we can, we, we, a lot of us will show up early if, if depending on the conditions and so forth or instruction on these. Uh, just let us know. Tow pilot is primarily responsible for manning the tow plane during this period. However, it is expected that others will give the pilot periodic relief in the interest of uh, minimizing fatigue. And that get, gets really important in the middle of the summer when it's so darn hot and you're sitting in that airplane for, for hours on end. Since each type of uh, glider has specific best towing speed, it's essential that tow pilot be aware of which type uh, towing at all times and observe proper speeds. 233 K8, uh, lightly loaded, uh, 65 miles an hour, and then all others should be towed at uh, 70 or higher uh, if requested by tow pilots, uh, may be the case when water is carried and so forth. And, and all of our bodies um, seem to indicate a little low. So we end up um, actually running about 80 on the indicated airspeed on the on the ponies, and that's just it. Just seems to be the, what what these airplanes about 80 indicated is really giving us about 70. But if you have any questions in the in the glider or or issues, I mean, you know, please let the the tow pilot know. We we generally don't get complaints about going too fast, but but uh, uh, usually it's on the slow side that we have problems. Uh, nothing in the instruction manual uh, should be interpreted as a substitute for good judgment of each individual pilot. In no case should any massive tow pilot feel induced to provide towing services under conditions which are perceived as being beyond his or her basic piloting skills or beyond the capabilities of the equipment in use. And every one of us has different uh, um, uh, basic uh, uh, proficiency. And, and you know, one, one person might not be comfortable on a, on a day where you have a strong northwest uh, flow coming over the, the ski area and so forth. So, so by all means, anybody that's, that's not comfortable, uh, don't, don't tow when you're not comfortable. And uh, you know, if you need someone else to, to get in the, uh, into, the, to the, uh, into service, by all means, you know, call me or, or call Mike or, or, or one of us uh, when the conditions get challenging. And then that comes, plays right into threat error management, which is, uh, uh, a big topic these days with the FAA and, and should be, everybody should be thinking about this glider pilot, tow pilot, everybody, uh, always be asking yourself, what's my threat and how do I manage it? And there's always threats out there. Sometimes they're greater than others, sometimes they're, they're less. But ask yourself, what's my, what's my threat right now and how am I going to manage it uh, as I go forward? Because that, that's, you want to be thinking that all the time. Okay. Operations in the manual does uh, talk about operations in windy conditions. Again, tow pilot has primary responsibility for deciding when the weather becomes too hazardous. Uh, tow pilot has responsibility for determining the conditions are safe for takeoff. Tow pilot also has the authority to terminate the flight line operations and uh, uh, in order the securing of the ships. Uh, operations, and this is the specifics in, in the operations, in the operations with wind speeds are just Above 17 knots, 20 miles an hour require a person on each wing tip of the club gliders, additional person on the tail of the 233. Uh, with wind gusts exceeding 22 knots, 25 miles an hour gliders, <coughs> club gliders must be returned to hangar. And with uh, steady winds or gusts reaching 30 knots, 35 miles an hour tow planes shall be returned to hangar. So these are limitations placed on us, but personal limitations may uh, uh, encourage you to get the airplanes back in the hangar. Uh, before the uh, limits are reached. Okay, talking pre-flight ground operations, takeoff, climb uh, operations. 
just a few things to note uh, on the <coughs> specifics. Um, are, uh, uh, it should be uh, emphasized that the priorities governing massive towing operations uh, are to be observed strictly in the order of priority of safety, care of the club equipment, and uh, expedition <coughs> service. Uh, during the pre-flight, tow pilots responsible for thorough pre-flight inspection of the tow plane remember to check the tow hook and release mechanism. And again, a lot of times our, our, our tow pilots are sitting in these airplanes for hours on end, and things can happen outside after you do multiple takeoffs that they might not be aware of. So anybody walking around the airplanes, look them over as you, as you go around. We had a, a, a wire, flying wire, come off of a, a Pawnee a couple of years ago. There's two on each uh, that go from the bottom of the fuselage up to the tail surface uh, on each one, and one of them uh, broke off when I think uh, Jim uh, Chick was flying it. And, uh, and it just, it came from corrosion over a long period of time. These airplanes were used as uh, crop dusters, so there's, there's a chance of corrosion. So, so I think somebody on the ground actually picked that up. Uh, we're not doing a free flight every time we, we land the airplane. Um, tow pilot must refuse to fly an aircraft he considers a tow plane. <laughs> Uh, to a plane to be not airworthiness. And, and any time that that happens, please, please give someone a call to let, let uh, people know so we can get it repaired. We've got uh, Charles over in uh, um, Chambersburg. He's only about a half hour, 45 minutes away. And, and, and we have Matt Parr, who's been, been helping me down at the hangar. And, and he's almost <coughs> available on a, almost a daily basis. When things go wrong, we can get him in pretty quick to, to get it resolved. Uh, we're down one, we only have two Pawnees and the one Super Cub now, so we're down one, one Pawnee. Tow pilots should avoid taxiing over the tow rope, especially on hard surface runways. Okay, that's a good one to remember. And then uh, standardized taxiing technique. This way everybody knows where everybody is. This is not in the, in the manual, that's why I call it a technique and not necessarily a procedure. But if we're all doing the same thing, then everybody knows where everybody is. And, and, and here we have the tow plane approaching the glider head to head. And sometimes we'll see that in springtime when the, when the conditions are too uh, wet to <coughs> land in the grass. But normally we'll be coming off the, uh, the uh, 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 east side and then towing and then turning in front. And if, if you'll make, if the tow plane will make a nice sweeping turn across the front of the glider, uh, that way you're not depending on any brakes, uh, number one, uh, to, to turn the airplane. Uh, it saves on brakes, number one. Number two, it's a safer operation in that you're not depending on the brake to miss the glider or people, and, and uh, uh, brakes fail sometimes. So, so if you come across the front of the tow plane with a sweeping turn back onto the runway, uh, the uh, ground handler can be positioned on the left, out by the left wing tip, and he's in view of the tow pilot the entire time. As the tow pilot taxis by, he can pick up the, the line, the rope, and then walk over to the right side and let the rope pay out as the tow pilot uh, pulls back up onto the runway. Uh, in, in that way, the tow pilot can be looking in the rear view mirror and see when the pigtail is approaching the nose of the airplane and know when to stop with almost all of the, the, uh, the uh, slack already um, paid out of the, out of the rope. Uh, and at that point, he can, the uh, ground here can drop the rope uh, here and go over and attach it to the glider, and now the rope has this nice kink on it that goes back and forth. Again, when I'm when a tow pilot is looking in the rearview mirror, I can see that kink starting to come out of the rope, and I know that I'm almost I almost have all the slack pulled up, so I can basically um, anticipate it and stop the the uh, tow plane before I snag the uh, the glider, and and, and uh, it, it works real well. Uh, so if you You'll do it the same way each time. We, we get pretty good at this and knowing where we can stop to get almost all the slack taken out of the rope and so forth. And it makes, makes just for a, a smoother operation all the way around. The uh, uh, one thing you will have to remember though, if you're towing with the PA-18 or you're, or you're ground handling with the PA-18, the rear view mirror on PA-18 sucks. And <laughs> to put it in front of you. It, you can't, you just can't see very well, so it's very difficult to know when the slack uh, gets taken up. We're actually trying.
trying to look for a rear view mirror that might fit under this drive. Yes, Mike? It, it, it's really helpful if you don't have the rope go straight down the runway. That kink that John's talking about is the key for yeah. us not to pull you halfway down the runway. Yeah. Let it go sideways. We can yeah. see that. Yeah. We cannot see a straight line down the runway. Right. Some some guys some guys will take the can, the can and you know Does give it a big yank and it just makes a pile of rope and then I then I have no idea when the when the slack's mm -hmm. there from that. And you want to put it on that south side. Side. Yeah. Left, we, don't, we don't have a mirror there. So. Yeah. yeah. Every now and then we'll get somebody to reverse it. Yeah. So getting ready for, for takeoff, uh, look back to confirm the glider's wings are still in the level position. Uh, make a takeoff announcement on the radio. I always like to make that announcement before I'm going because I'm, I, I only can do one thing at a time. I can't talk in the radio, push the power up, look in the, in the pattern and so forth. So I usually make the call a little bit early. Uh, when I'm sitting in position already to start the tow. But uh, uh, you want to make the announcement uh, on the radio and uh, glider in tow uh, with a left turn out or right turn out, whatever, whatever you plan to do. Uh, let everybody know. Let's see, initiate uh, a wag of your rudder and witness a return uh, rudder wag from the glider. It, like, again, it's hard to see from the, uh, from the PA-18. Um, it's a little easier with the economies, uh, but a lot of, sometimes we just don't see that. Uh, it, it is difficult to say, yeah, Bill. What happens if you don't see the glider? Well, you're really depending on the wing walker to verify that for you. He should he should see the wing waggle on the on the tow plane, wing waggle on the glider, and then give you the signal. So when often, he often you can't see that. So the only thing right. you really depend on. Exactly. He, he's, he's verifying those have taken place. So when he gives you the signal, that's your signal that yes, you, everybody's ready to go. And, and they've gotten the, the wing waggle, or the rudder waggle. Okay. Confirm the wing runners uh, is also signaling readiness to begin the launch. If the pattern and, and runway are clear. And, and, and make sure, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll tow and I'll watch the wing walker in the rear view mirror and, and some guys will look the entire pattern over and that's that's what we really like to see and sometimes it, it might be a little bit less than than a, a good uh, a good clearing of the pattern and make sure you, you do uh, check the pattern so are we instructing wing walkers to look for the post-time before they start circling yes i hope so yeah yeah they should be mimicking with the glider no, they should be yeah. I'm just curious is that an actual the wing runner should not signal go until both the tow plane and the glider have acknowledged that they're both ready. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Fly full power deliberately, not too rapidly. Uh, there may be some slack remaining in the in the rope. And then when towing the 233, fly power slowly at first to prevent the banging of the tail during the initial ground roll. <coughs> during the climb, the primary requirement uh, of the towing operation are to maintain a correct and constant attitude and to avoid maneuvers or attitudes. Uh, which are inconsistent with the experience of the of the uh, glider pilot. So you got to know who's behind you, what kind of airplane, and so forth. But in general, um, unless a fully experienced pilot is in the glider, turns should be restricted to bank angles of 20 degrees or less. With students on tow, turning should be held to the minimum consistent with safety. And delay any turnouts of, tra of traffic pattern until passing an altitude of 300 feet, but prior to 400 feet. Uh, flying, yeah, like we said earlier, flying using attitude as the primary reference, a fixed nose position, and I added in here airplane nose because I, I had a student one time that I that I he was getting ready to land and I said raise your nose and I looked over and he went. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kid you not. Was it on a triple seven? I kid you not. That's so. awesome. <laughs> Um, so a fixed nose position uh, may entail some speed variations, but give the glider pilot a steady reference to fly behind. And that's what everybody wants, is a nice, steady platform to fly behind. 
In that case, he has to be near to hold altitude or attitude. Even with glider boxes the wake, also try to fly straight while the wake is being boxed. Uh, cross the established traffic pattern at an altitude of at least 1,200 feet uh, above the ground. So we're usually circling left or circling right and coming back over the field, depending on which way the wind's coming from and, and, and so forth. Always working ourselves up, upwind. At the release, make a turn uh, of 90 degrees and fly straight until away from the release point. And this will prevent the tow plane and the glider from both returning to the release point at the same altitude. The cool down of the uh, engine. Uh, one, a couple of airplanes have the, the EPI um, gauge, which will tell you what the, the actual um, cool down rate is. And we don't want to see more than uh, 50 degrees per minute. And that usually means that after your release, you're only bringing the power back 100 or more RPMs as you start back towards the field for the first couple minutes as it, as it cools down. Uh, and then once, after the first couple minutes, then you can bring the power back to about 20, uh, 2,000 or so and, and get down into the uh, field. Okay, let's see. Landing let down to pattern altitude should be made in an area away from uh, the traffic. Uh, usually what I try to do is come over up the field above the, above the uh, pattern and then make a left turn back around and enter a, a right down. And, uh, sometimes, depending on the height of the tow, you know, 5,000 foot ridge tow, it might take me a little bit longer to, to get down. And uh, instead of making a, a, a tight circle, over that area, it's better just to extend out a little bit more and, and come back into the, to, into the uh, traffic pattern. Post flight, upon returning the tow plane to the hangar, the pilot must complete the uh, flight log entries, note any discrepancies uh, noted during the day's operation. We call somebody if there are discrepancies, and uh, if the grounding items notify the tow plane uh, godfather immediately, just make sure that everybody's aware. The, uh, and spend a little time cleaning the ship, and, and that really, if you know, if if the glider, if the tow pilot's been up there for nine hours towing airplanes, the last thing he really wants to do is clean airplanes. So while people putting gliders away and stuff, maybe that would be a good time for people just to pitch in a little bit and, and get the airplane cleaned up, because that's that's exactly when you're going to find problems is during that cleanup. And everybody likes to get into a clean airplane in the morning anyhow rather than one that's covered with bugs and, and, and oil and everything. Okay. Traffic pattern, I think, Glenn, you're going to talk about traffic patterns, so I won't hit much on here. Uh, but we have, the, uh, we have the paved runway, and then, of course, we've got uh, grass on each side of the runway that we use. And normally, we will fly a right-hand pattern and land on the right side where the gliders are flying the left-hand pattern landing on the left side. Normal tow plane patterns right in. Uh, and uh, remember that uh, the aeronautical charts and the segmented circles surrounding the windsock depict right hand traffic for runway 33. Uh, therefore, pilots should anticipate visiting airplane traffic to fly right hand traffic patterns. So that's where you're going to see the, uh, the transient airplanes coming into a right hand pattern. So always be aware of, of, of that, uh, that fact. And it may or may not be on the radio. Uh, there's there's not a requirement to be on the radio. Yeah, they may not have a radio. I don't have a radio in the, in the Davis. Uh, so, so knowing where, where to expect people, again, that kind of goes back to the threat error management. Where's my, where's my, my, uh, my threat? Well, when I'm coming downwind, my threat probably over here on the right-hand pattern. Maybe there's a glider or someone over there uh, coming, over, coming into a left-hand pattern. And then as I approach the key position to turn base, now maybe my threat is a long final, someone down here in the long final. So that, these are the places we should be looking. Um, we always tend to look at the runway. Whenever we get in the traffic pattern, we're always got our eyeballs on the runway and not the most likely point for our real threats, which are other aircraft that are, that are coming into the pattern. So, so always keep that in mind, you know, like we said before. Okay. So from a tow pilot, uh, uh, perspective, uh, please review your logbooks, um, check for BFR, uh, club recurrent training, and currency per 9161 or 69, uh, and then schedules needed. And, and like I say, the sooner 
we can get this done early in the spring, the better off it is because I get real busy and everybody else gets real busy in the, in the summer months. So we'd like to have everybody uh, sort away by then. Uh, review the PA18, PA25 manuals that are online club documents and then fill out return the knowledge sheets for both airplanes. It's just a good review. It's an open book uh, test. So, so, you know, look up the answers, but it's a good review that we all need to do on a yearly basis just to, just to keep our currency up on, on our airplanes and then have a safe season. That's it. <laughs>
um, condition. We know you can get dehydrated by sweating. You can replace that with water, etc. But cold diuresis is a little different. Um, it has nothing to do with sweating, and it cannot, let me emphasize that, it cannot be prevented by adequate drinking beforehand. So what is cold diuresis? All right. You have a certain fluid volume in your vessels that you need to maintain uh, fluid levels in all the tissues. When your body gets chilled, read up at cloud base. I'm not talking wave flights here, although it can happen with waves. You go up in the, in the uh, hot summer, you go to cloud base, you're feeling a little chilly. When your body feels chilly, it naturally constricts the peripheral vessels and shunts the fluid to the core. Now, that means that there's less volume in the vessels. And your kidneys respond to that by getting rid of that excess. So, you picture this. You have so much fluid, maybe you were smart enough to stay hydrated, we're all walking around with camelbacks, that's really good. You go up, your body feels chilled, it decreases the volume, and it decreases the fluid. That fluid goes where? To the bladder, okay? Not only is the fluid going, but the electrolytes that balance that fluid are also going. So you have a loss of fluid and electrolytes, both critical. And as long as you stay cold, you are not dehydrated, okay? All right, so maybe in a wave flight, when it's cold on the ground, this is not a huge problem. However, on a warm day, you can't stay at cloud base, perhaps. Now you come down and you warm up. As soon as you begin to feel less chilled, your body opens those vessels, and now it doesn't have enough fluid to maintain that balance. So you are volume depleted. Not just water, volume meaning blood, electrolytes, etc. You're volume depleted. You cannot prevent this by drinking early, staying hydrated, whatever. It will happen. You have to be aware that it will happen. And as you come down and warm up, you have to replace that volume. If you don't, you're going to feel quite bad, um, depending on how bad it gets and how chilled you were, et cetera. But it's going to take its biggest thing, its biggest effect, perhaps as you're entering the pattern or doing a pull-up because you're so happy with the end of your flight. Because when your volume depleted with all the dehydration things that we know, one of them that's often forgotten is you are very intolerant of increased Gs. So 45 to 60 degree bank, two Gs if you're 60, right? We all know that. Pull up, okay? This has been thought to be the cause of some of the crazy flying by experienced, competent pilots. Pilots, not you say, oh, they didn't know this or they didn't know that, but pilots who you respect, who all of a sudden did something really stupid. And we know those stories. If you don't, you can read about them. Um, and, and it could be the reduced G tolerance, could be just the cognition problem, the judgment problem, et cetera. But it's, it's real. So that cold diuresis that you must replace should be happening in the cockpit. We all know you need fluid in the cockpit. There's some discussion, should it be water, should it be sport drink, whatever. When you're just replacing water, the problem with sweating, etc., you probably are all right with plain water, although if you like sport drinks, that's fine. But when you're replacing the volume from cold diuresis, you must replace the electrolytes. If you only replace the water, now you're in a what's called hyponatremic state, low sodium, low potassium, that's hypokalemic, which causes all other problems. You can replace that 
with a sport drink. You can dilute it in half and it will still work and give you less sugar. You can replace it with water, which is my choice, and food, right? Our food has plenty of electrolytes in it. So if you take something in your cockpit, whether it be a sandwich with cheese or, you know, everything has some sodium in it. Um, so water and food or a sport drink. Not carbonated drinks with high sugar because that high sugar actually decreases the absorption of the fluid. Not fruit juice for the same reason. And we used to say not caffeine because it's diuretic. Though Dr. Johnson and some others make the point that um, if you are caffeine addicted, which many of us are, and you suddenly say on the weekends, I don't take caffeine, you're likely to have a headache, which is not helpful for flying. So they are saying if you want to have a cup of coffee in the morning, and if you want to have a caffeine drink of some sort through flying, probably that doesn't matter, but you shouldn't drink totally caffeine, certainly not energy drinks, high caffeine, right? Okay, so are there questions about the cold diuresis? Because I think it's really an important <coughs> subject. Okay, no? All right, then the other thing I would say is, and there is an article from 1996, Carl and Iris Streetick, called To Pee or Not to Pee. I don't know if you know that article, but it was very important and it's referenced in a lot of other articles. And their basic point is this. If you don't have a relief system, you are going to be filling your bladder and very uncomfortable. And in order to avoid that, you are going to be trying to ration your water intake. So any way you do it, it's going to turn out badly. But their point was, um, and they're what they cite an instance in 77, a pilot with a relatively minor accident with minor injuries, got to the hospital, major complications related to bladder rupture. As you can imagine, all that mess in there, major. So it is not okay to not have a relief system because you're just not gonna follow the hydration suggestion. You're going to be distracted with discomfort, uh, whether you're dehydrated, whether you, you have to go, whatever. So the, you, the, the fluid in your bladder is harmful and, and useless to you. Okay, so that's important. So you need a system, fluid management, you need a good way to take fluids with you, and you need a good way to urinate and get rid of those fluids somehow. I'm not gonna go into how you do that. Just take my word for it. People will answer you. There's all sorts of ways people do this and you must do it. Yes? As we all get older, is, are we more susceptible to the effects of dehydration? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and in fact, I have a section I'll do a little bit on related to how did we get away with this? In the 80s, I don't know about you, mine was 60s and 70s, I flew with one can of Coke. Five, six hours, one can of Coke. How did I do that? Um, First of all, I was healthy young. Hopefully my kidneys were working. Second of all, I flew uncomfortable, right? I mean, it just, and maybe that's why the accident rate was so high. I was lucky, I think we're lucky. That is not acceptable anymore. And I think that started 25, maybe even 30 years ago, that push that we have to drink. So we were lucky, we were young, we were healthy. Now you look at aging, first of all, your kidneys concentrate urine. A healthy kidney senses, actually the pituitary senses that you're low on fluids and the kidney begins to shove the water back to the body. That's why the urine gets that dark yellow that we're all warned about because the kidney's working. Well, the kidney doesn't work so well when you get older. The sensitivity is less, the concentration effect is less, um, the bladder capacity is less. And then you work on people who perhaps have blood pressure problems, very common. I'm sure there's a lot of people on blood pressure medicine. They're different types. 
One of the most com uh, common is a diuretic. <coughs> I just defined that for you. It pulls water out. It keeps your blood pressure down by making you slightly dehydrated. So you're already low when you start. That's okay as long as you don't get lower, right? We also have people with uh, cardiovascular problems so that um, their heart isn't putting out the fluid as well. So those are aging issues. People who have edema have, have fluid that is not helping. It's just you've seen people with swelling in the feet or something, and that actually impedes the, the flow of the fluid within the vessel. So, yes. Okay, um, a couple other things. We know alcohol is a diuretic. I don't think anybody in this room would try to hydrate with alcohol uh, or to drink alcohol in the morning to get started and start fully hydrated. However, many of us will meet great pilots with a can of beer and probably we get away with that. But in fact, the recommendation is to be sure to hydrate before you start the alcohol at the end of the day. Because if you're trying to rehydrate and you take alcohol, it's, it's counterproductive, okay? Okay, um, I guess what I want to say beyond that is just, um, I don't remember it now. Oh, I am hitting on this, okay. When you think about hydration, not just volume depletion, just not cold diuresis, but when you think about hydration, the way to win in this game, especially if you're a female, which I think I'm the only one in the room, but um, where we really are going to carry that urine with us all day, you don't want any extra. So you need to start drinking a lot <coughs> early. The minute I get up on days when I'm going to fly, I'm drinking, drinking, drinking. I overhydrate early in the morning because that gives my body a chance to get rid of all the excess. I don't want to fly with that excess. I tend to stop drinking 15 to 20 minutes before I'm going to fly. That gives me a chance to get rid of it and yet be fully hydrated. And then I drink every 15 to 30 minutes or when I want. Right? So um, my recommendation is don't wait. Start early. Drink a lot on the ground. Start your flight fully hydrated without any storage <laughs> issues. Now, the last thing I want to do is talk about thirst, um, because thirst gets talked about a lot in terms of it's unreliable. Johnson's point is thirst is extremely reliable, but if you think in terms of oil in a car, it is, a, he calls it an idiot light. It is a, a warning light. It is not a gauge. So when you are thirsty, you are already dehydrated. Okay, you should not feel thirsty if you're doing this right, except for the cold diuresis, which doesn't cause as much thirst. You should not feel thirsty during your flying day if you do it right. If you do feel thirsty, it varies between people when that happens. Most people feel thirst between 2% and 3% dehydration. Very few people have trained themselves to recognize 1%. So you can assume that if you're thirsty, you're at least 2% um, dehydrated. So I want to do a little math thing here. Everybody do this. You can write it. It's not too hard to do in your head. I want you to think of your weight. Okay, this would be the weight as you walk onto the field in the morning, and someday we should bring a, a scale. You don't have to publish the weight. That weight with an empty bladder. All right, now I want you to take 1% of that. That's easy, right? Just move the decimal point. <coughs> now I want you to double that. Got it? All right. Now, every pound um, that you lose through the day is one pint of fluid. Because a pint, that's two eight ounce cups, a pint is uh, equal to a pound. You do not lose fat or muscle in one day. Whatever you lost is fluid, okay? So you've got 2% of your body weight. You multiply that. Um, that tells you how many pints, but two pints make a quart. So now you can figure out how much fluid you've lost. 
okay? If you feel thirsty on the ground, you need to drink as quickly as you can. Your stomach can only take so much, so it may be, about, it may be periodic, but as quickly as you can, all of that fluid to replace what you lost. Then you need to get a better drinking regimen, which is somewhere between a cup an hour and a quart an hour, depending on what you're sweating and losing. In the cockpit, we actually, if you're, if you're not hot, you're actually not sweating very much. So the main problem in the cockpit really is starting dehydrated. It's pretty easy to maintain if you start hydrated. But if you feel thirsty, you know that you're already about 2% low. You need to replace that, and then you need to start drinking more because it's not working. Okay, so you all know now how much you've lost. If you get on a scale in the morning, you get on a scale right before you're gonna fly. All that sweating, pushing the glider on, whatever. See what you've lost. And then if you want to inform yourself, weigh yourself after you urinate, when you land. And you can see how you're doing, right? Now, hopefully you've heard that you can tell by looking at the color of your urine. If you're lucky enough to have a tube that's clear, you can do that. It is unnecessary to have clear urine. Some people think, you know, clear is a great thing. Unnecessary to have clear urine. That means you've overhydrated and your kidneys are doing a really good job in getting rid of the excess which is fine if it's going out your wheel well, but not so good if you've got to carry it around in the cockpit with you. Um, if you have dark yellow or dark amber urine, your kidneys are concentrating because you are low. You're not drinking enough. Good hydration would be reflected in a, a pale yellow urine, but usually you, you don't have the opportunity to see that. So I have a lot more here, which I'm not going to say. Any questions? All right, please let me know if you want these articles. I will copy them and get them to you. Knuckles. I've been a club member since I think 2000. I've uh, been a flight instructor for 35 years, uh, both power and glider. Um, uh, it's just a, been a great experience to be in the club to uh, do the flying. Uh, I know there's going to be a few of you who are going to be going for uh, your uh, commercial and your instructor, so all of us here, we're looking forward to working with you hopefully this summer get it done. Uh, also, for those of you who know, I'm also with the FAA, but I'm here as an instructor today. Uh, but I do carry my badge, so uh, be careful out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, first off, the absolute ceiling. Uh, years ago, gosh, this is going back now, probably a good 30 years ago, I listened to a, a talk about somebody talking about knowing your absolutes. Uh, and basically we all have, when we're flying or whatever activity we do, especially if there's an inherent amount of danger, we have to know what our absolutes are. In other words, what should we not exceed before it gets into the danger zone? So I want to talk a little about that, called your absolute ceiling. I want to talk a little about how to maintain it to peak level and how to raise it. Absolute ceiling, it's, uh, I define it as your ability to operate, to safely operate, a given aircraft, whatever that is, in a given situation, at any given time. So that's really, it's a lot there, but it's uh, talked about a little bit more about that. Another way to look at it is it's your maximum level of competency for a given task in a given aircraft at a given time. <coughs> some examples, some tasks or competencies. Crosswind takeoff and landing. We all have, depending on the airplane and how long it's been, what our limits are gonna be. So we need to know, know that. Uh, accuracy landing, we all be able to know that, hey, we can put it down safely at a spot and stop safely. Normal and usual patterns, thermaling, including the gaggle, handling premature toe termination, or what a lot of people have called rope break, but it doesn't have to be a rope break. Uh, speed to fly for a given task. Um, uh, 
speed to fly, most of us thought, think of it as inner thermal speed, but I learned a long time ago that speed to fly could be anything from in the pattern to uh, in a thermal to whatever that task is, that's your speed to fly for a given task. And of course, things like cross country going beyond the uh, final glide procedures. Uh, can anybody think of any other task right off the top of your head that, that isn't covered here that would be a task or a competency you think is important? Good. <laughs> <laughs> Your absolute ceiling will remain at a peak level by maintaining proficiency in each task. Primarily, as long as you're out there, continue flying uh, by yourself or with somebody else and practicing all these different, different things, uh, or at least performing those different things, you're going to keep it at pretty much your peak level. My peak level at a certain task is going to be different than um, somebody else's peak task, say in cross country. I haven't done a lot of it for a while because I've been busy instructing. So I got a guarantee before I go out again, I'm probably going to dip my toe in the water, try to pick somebody who I know has been pretty confident cross country and say, hey, can we hop in a grove, you know, or whatever, and let's do something. Uh, so, so for me, you know, maintaining that proficiency, or my absolute ceiling is going to be different depending on what I've been doing. Um, of course, your absolute ceiling, as I talked about, will lower by not staying proficient for any given task. So the minute you haven't done something for a while, whatever that is, whether it's practicing a premature rope break in a safe altitude or, or some other maneuver or, 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 or tasking, uh, your ceiling is going to get lower. In other words, you, you shouldn't see that. Safe flight also relies on knowing and not exceeding your absolute ceiling. That is so important. Um, knowing it, number one, and then not exceeding it. Uh, for example, you go off and today you haven't flown uh, this airplane or this glider for a while and the winds are now kind of gusting up in the 15 knot range and they're kind of coming out of that quarter and, and, and it's coming off where you know it's going to be coming off the hill. You haven't flown in a while. You're going to have to know that you're, you probably may not want to take that flight that day, depending on that your, your ceiling has lowered because you haven't done it in a while. Um, that's just one example. Knowing your absolute ceiling requires you to be self-aware of your proficiency and being honest with yourself. That's more accidents if we were able to, to reconstruct it by talking to the pilot. We find a lot of times uh, they just were not aware uh, of the situation that was developing and they just weren't honest with themselves about the flight. Um, long ago, a good example was there was an accident where somebody had, they, they, everybody survived, but it was in a, it was a crosswind situation. The airplane went off into the trees after landing and people were okay, but we found that this guy had not flown in a crosswind for years. But what happened was he had friends coming out to fly and they'd been putting them off, putting them off because of weather. They finally came out. The airplane was available, so he said, well, you know, the pressure, the stress to take them up Instead of sending him home, was just too much. So he took the flight, and he knew he shouldn't have. So he really wasn't honest with himself, but he was some stress there. You guys have seen this in the, in the hangar. Uh, I would encourage you, it's called the Pilot Current Barometer. You can get it online. There's a copy of it there. And that's a great um, situa uh, situational awareness with respect to your absolute ceiling, whether or not you should make that flight. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at it and, and, and not memorize it, but just maybe look at it every time if it's been a while since you flown. Lance? Yes, quick question. I've seen that and I've stared at it and it doesn't say what the time frame is. Uh, What's the time frame? <laughs> is that a year? It says hours at the top. I know, total hours? Hours, yeah. yeah. Total, total hours. Like your life or hours? Your hour? Well, well, we year? <laughs> 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 we'll see, and that, and you know, again, this is not perfect. That's a good point. It's, but I think it's just. Okay. That's 12 months. Yeah, 12 months. Okay, previous 12 months. All right, thanks. So you got launches, hours, whatnot. And again, that's just a gauge, you know? But keep in mind, your baseline is what you, what's important. Where you, where your absolute ceiling and, and your peak performance is going to be different depending on your level of competency. You know, somebody who's, who's a commercial might have more competency than somebody who's a private. But I have seen a lot of private pilots. A lot more competent commercial pilots because maybe they haven't flown in so long. So, again, it's it's a feel. Okay, great, thank you. 
Uh, operating aircraft beyond your absolute ceiling, as I mentioned, could result in a mishap. Way to keep your ceiling at peak level. Of course, I gotta say this about the FAA, maintain your regulatory currency. But we all know that's not nearly enough. Maintain your flight and knowledge proficiency. Knowledge is also important too. I mean, to the safety meetings, going to, 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 to the stuff that you get online. Uh, just listen to people who have been there, done that, and asking questions can raise your, 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 your knowledge. Sometimes accidents occur because you don't know what you don't know. If you known that that was a hazard or problem, you may have not have gone. So sometimes having your, increase your knowledge helps you more than just maintain your flight proficiency. Fly some without you, fly with someone without you being qualified. It doesn't have to be an instructor. Like I said, sometimes I might fly with somebody who I, you know, I might say, hey, I would love to fly with you because you've got more experience in, in this aspect based on my observation. Would you come fly with me? If it happens to be an instructor, great. If not, I'm fine. You know, either way, I, I would encourage you that if you want to ex um, uh, keep your peak, maybe fly with somebody to be qualified. Raising your absolute ceiling. In other words, I want to become better at something, or I want to be able to do a task that I've never been able to do before. Again, increase your aeronautical knowledge level. Increase your experience, your experience and skills in a safe manner. If you want to go out and say, I haven't ever done a, 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 a crosswind landing in, in winds in excess of 15 knots, uh, as long as you're within the airplane's uh, known uh, crosswind capability, Go up to somebody, go up to the instructor. You know, get, increase your proficiency. And again, I hope this is fast enough. Thanks for your attention. Now for something completely different, I got a quick little two minute video. I thought kind of, kind of, if it works. If it doesn't work. Well, hope I, you have to, I think I have to. You have to do it? Okay, hold on here. Yeah, go to the last slide and I'll click on it. There it is. Down there at the very lower, lower left. Oh yeah, so there it is. So this one was somebody making oh, a off-field landing. For those who haven't, you see, so this is this was his only choice. He posted it. Well, that's what they called stupidvideos.com. He was stupid enough to post it. <laughs> Casey didn't catch it. He did it one more time. This is really he did it. Himself. He actually did it. <laughs> he almost made the driveway. This is <laughs> and he walked away. <laughs> one more, one more here, just uh, real quick, less than a minute. Now tell me if you can see what we're looking at. So far, no spoilers out. No spoilers out. <coughs> over rotates. Oh. Oh. No, it's, it's not over. <laughs> then, then he adds the spoilers right about now. <laughs> and it's not over. <laughs> know your absolute ceiling. Thanks, guys. <laughs> instructional flights. I think it was 19 different pilots I flew with. Only five of them were students, so I got a pretty good splattering of the uh, rated pilots as well in here. But just some of the things that I've observed looking at it through the various phases of flight. So on takeoffs, lack of preparation is probably a little bit strong. Just not taking full advantage of the preparation we could do, you know. 
still seeing a lot of folks not using written checklists, or if they are using them, <coughs> they're not using them until after they're in the glider, tow planes taxiing up, they get ready to hook up the rope, now they're turning on radios, setting out timbers, and all that other stuff. A lot of that stuff, get it done before you get in the glider. I advocate a pre-launch checklist where I get all that creep out of the way, and then my takeoff checklist is basically hook up the cable and go. Everything else has been done. Um, also, anticipating the uh, performance. You know, if you've flown with me, you've heard the whole pitch. Where I want to hear on takeoff. You know, where do you expect the lift off? Where do you expect the tow plane to lift off? And if it's not playing out that way, you know, you think you're going to be off two hash marks down the thing, and you've gone four. There's probably something wrong. Be prepared to get off. You know, we don't have that many emergencies, but we do have to formulate a plan for when we do. You know, how many people in this room have actually had a flight instructor in training give you an emergency on takeoff where they pull the release or somehow you end up off tow that you couldn't get back to the field? You know, in general, we have a bad habit in our training. We're getting terrible training when we do rope breaks in premature releases because everyone you've ever seen came back. That's not always the right answer. Okay, so think through that before you ever get in the glider. The other one is the early turns on tow. This is really a tow pilot thing. John stood up here and he showed the manual thing about don't turn before 300 feet. And that's pretty much the standard number you'll find in any written material about towing. We tend to, we have a noise sensitive house off the end of the runway. There's other ways to avoid it, but that early turn, first off, it may catch the pilot by surprise and get him out of position, especially if we have turbulent air. It also immediately takes the 180 turn to get back if they were so inclined and makes it a 270. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've just compounded the problem. You've taken away options from the tow pilot or from the, for the glider pilot, in that rare case that we have a problem on tow that we have to get off. You also got to think about the turning room consideration, and again, this comes to play in that scenario, because right, you can't turn on a dime. It takes, you have a radius involved in the turn, and the instinct, you get 90 degrees of turn now early, the instinct's to turn to the field. We have this unhealthy desire never to turn our back on the field below about a thousand feet. Well, now you're coming in, you're going to get real tight, you've got to reverse the turn, and that second turn, reversing it from, say, a left turn to a right turn to turn on final, is probably the one that could kill you. So, you're going to do a 270 anyway, consider maybe going the long way around and come through. If everything was working, and you looked at your takeoff spot and you met it and the tow plane got off where you're expected, your rate of climb, even behind the super club, is going to be greater than the sink rate of the glider once you're by yourself. So mathematically, everything's going in your favor, um, taking the wind out of consideration, obviously, on that. Also, the geometry of the airport. We're going to lift off in the first third of the runway. So your climb starts there, maybe half the runway, because it's really high. So the first half of the runway, so your climb starts there, you only got to get back to the far end. So you've got an extra thousand feet or something working towards you horizontally. Just things to think about as we start this next season, right, your takeoffs. The other one is traffic pattern. You know, we have a real rigid thinking, you know, we say here's the traffic pattern. And I've watched guys come in with not a chance that they were going to get to the IP and fly a pattern. But they're going to go to that IP because that's the traffic pattern that they've been told. You've got to think more in terms of the uh, having the flexibility, having you know, plan A, plan B, plan C. Heck, go to double A. You know, just always have a plan and have it in there. The, <coughs> we, we want to get the aircraft on the ground by any means. Obviously, certain variants of twisting up that pattern may be disruptive to the rest of the operation. If you have time, remember, aviate, navigate, communicate. But if you can get on the radio, that's a fine opportunity why we have them. You know, let people know that, hey, you know, I, 
I'm coming back. It's going to be non-standard. I'm doing a straight in. Or I'm, I'm joining on base. Or you've seen at least three cases in the last year and a half where the downhill landing on 1-5 should have at least been in the guy's plan. You know, one of them, it should have been done. Uh, another one, it should have at least been a safety valve. It ended up being able to fly the fall pattern, and that was probably somewhere in between. You could have made a case that it was uh, necessary on the second one. Um, yeah, it, it's a good way to get in and get the thing on the ground safely versus coming around and end up shortening the trees. Part of that is the late preparation, not recognizing it. You know, a lot of times you're coming in, you know. You're a mile or two out yet. You know if you're going to make it. You know if you want to shoot for the midfield downwind. Maybe you just want to bail out and go right to the uh, uh, base leg. But be thinking about that early and get all the other administrative stuff out of the way. I, I watch time and time again folks not starting to run a checklist until they're in the pattern and they're halfway, three quarters of the way down, downwind when they finally take their head back out of the cockpit from looking at the checklist and they haven't done any wind corrections and all that. So it's catch up the whole way. The other one there is the uh, coming in from the east. You know, you're heading back from Emmitsburg to the airport. You're heading right for the IP. Now you get to the IP, but you want to go the other way. Again, that, that habit of not wanting to turn you back on the airport, so they turn towards the airport. So a radius takes them right over the runway, and now they're fighting to get back out so they can get turning in for base. All that could have been pre-planned as you were approaching it. And you fade one way or the other and make a sweeping turn into it. Okay? But nobody's thinking of that until they get there. Well, a lot of folks aren't thinking about it until they get there. So try, try to bring that in as part of the pacing of getting things set up. And then the last one on there is the wind. Think about what the wind's going to do before you get the downwind. Put the correction in early. You got a, I'll use 10 degree crab on downwind. Put the 10 degree crab in when you turn final. And it's probably the same, most likely a little bit less, but it's easier to take it out than roll out like a lot of folks are doing, straight down, and then they get blown over. Now they gotta put the correction in first to get back to where they want it to be, and then to keep it from getting worse again. So. It's a lot easier to take a little bit extra out than to correct for something you didn't put in. And then the approach path. Now you're on final. Stabilized approach, it's a high emphasis item now for flight reviews. Uh, the FAA defines it in a uh, powered airplane VFR 500 feet. For gliders, they want you stabilized um, at 100. For power, they tell them to go around. If they're not, they don't address that with gliders. But <laughs> obviously, you don't want this sweeping, uh, you know, as you're taking the bank angle out and you're touching the ground. Get yourself stabilized so you can see it. I advocate steeper versus shallow. If anything, it gives you a better view of your aim point. If you're off a half a degree, it's only going to make a few foot difference. If you're at a low raised angle, you know, um, you're going to be much further off. And then corrections. So if you have here and you're low, how do you correct? Do you adjust so your aim point, you know, is going to stop moving and you're not going any lower and you're just going to take it and just come down here, get to the same point? Or are you going to close everything up, hit that line and come back down? In my view, the, the latter is the proper way. You don't want to just keep shallowing it out and, and letting it go. And the same goes for being high. If you're high, go ahead and aggressively get yourself back down on this line and get stabilized. If you're high and you're trying to stay, you know, bring it all the way down, you're complicating things and you're not getting the benefit of a consistent sight picture. So get yourself back on that line. And then the rollout, you know, obviously directional control, right? But as you're rolling out, always assume you got somebody behind you. Because you can't see back there real well. Maybe you missed the radio call, maybe you didn't make one. 
you know, so don't stop in the middle of the runway. Roll it out. As you're getting down towards the um, launch line, don't turn towards the hard stuff and the expensive stuff. You got lots of area on the other side. It's not that hard to move across the runway. You know, clear towards the tree line, and uh, we'll walk it on back. I've seen a lot of folks coming in with extra energy into the launch line. Haven't hit anything yet, but you know, when we do, we're going to wish we hadn't. And it's not out of the question. I mean, uh, Caesar Creek. You know, first weekend or two of their season last year, they, I think it was a tow plane glider. It may have been two gliders, but it was the same thing. Guy turned towards the uh, crowd and took out the airplane he was flying and the uh, and another one. So, not the way to start the season. And this kind of tying it together, I just I looked at the accident rate from 2012 through last year and the breakout. You know, I talked about the whole landing pattern and all that. Well. That's where we have 66% of our accidents is in landing. The good news is we're going slow, we're hitting. And of course, I said the party doesn't account for half of them. So these are the reported accidents. The good news on landing, we have the majority of the accidents, but the fatalities are only around 5 6%. You know, we're going slow, even hitting into the trees. And, and most of the, you know, off, most of them are on the home airport. It's not off-field landings where these accidents are happening at home, and the aircraft usually ends up short of the runway, not long. <coughs> People not planning properly and adjusting for the wind. The takeoff accidents, you can say they're only 20%, but a third of them have fatalities involved. A third of the takeoff accidents that are reported involve a fatality. Might give you a little motivation to think about it a little bit before you go so you have that plan. Because we do do a lot of training for takeoff emergencies, but we do them in a benign, always get back. But when it happens for real life, the outcome isn't nearly as good as it is in training. Any questions? So I just have a comment. Maybe I missed it, but in the beginning when you were talking about takeoff, wind or the Checklist. Yeah, sure wind is bad. If you're slow and, uh, you know, if you're, depending on which way the tow plane's taking you, know, hopefully he's taking the end of the wind to give you some, some, some option for, yeah. I guess it's downwind so you can turn into the wind to come back. <coughs> that has a huge impact on your planning on how you go yep. back to the runway if you're able to do it. Yeah, no, I, and I, I didn't mention wind there. I'm, I'm trying to keep it moving and also just not being all encompassing. That's all part of that pre-flight, pre-launch uh, planning. You gotta take in all those considerations. Other questions? All right, well since I'm here, I wanna do one other real quick thing. We got a handful of instructors in the club. I know we're gonna try to mint some more in the next year or two. But I, I think wanna give a little bit of recognition to them. Lance, in particular, 105 instructional flights last year. <laughs> yeah. I, I think Paul was a close second. He was just under 100. I think it was 97. Slacker. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's almost half of the club's flying is dual instruction. It, it's, uh, it's a high percentage of it. And... Uh, you know, it's a handful of folks carrying it, so take care of those guys. who got the three-year term by one vote. <laughs> well, only one person voted for him. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
Right. And Mike Higgins got the, uh, the two. Oh, yeah. so, so what we need to do now is vote for president. That's right. So uh, how do we typically do it? Just a piece of paper and, and get it. Uh, that's probably the best way. Is there, 